Committee. Before we start, I'd like to begin by welcoming those members of the public, um, the councillors, etc., in this room and officers, and also a few housekeeping rules. Um, if you need to use the facilities, they're located back through the main doors as you came in, and on each landing there are some toilets. Um, if there's a fire alarm, we're not intending to have any alarms, please leave the building by the nearest fire exit and make your way to the Cathedral Concourse. Thank you. Okay, uh, first introductions. My name's uh, Councillor Chris Harper. I'm your chair today. I'm joined by Councillors Hiller, Rush, B, Bond, Hogg, Hussein, Iqbal, Warren, James and Sharp, um, who are your councillors today, who will join me in determining what's before us. And we've also got uh, planning officers, highways representation, legal representation and support from our democratic services colleagues. Item one then is apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chair. We have apologies from Councillor Jamil. Councillor B is here as substitute. We also have apologies from Councillor Andrew Bond. Councillor Sandra Bond is here also as a substitute. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the service for coming along. Thank you. Item three then is declaration to make representation as a ward councillor. Councillor Rush. Thank you, Chair. I will be making representations on item 4.1, the land at Orsi Toll, and I'll be removing myself from the meeting. Thank you. Happy? Yeah. Thank you very much. Any others? No? Okay. Um, I've been asked uh, members to change the agenda order. I think that's only fair, uh, considering the two items we've got on today, and one is quite small, um, and that is to push item 4.2. Uh, to the first item, uh, which is the east of Tolmers, Lo Tolmers Leicester Road in Thornhall. Uh, do members agree for me to change the agenda for that one to come first? We all agree? Thank you. Okay, then. So we move to item 4.2. This is land to the east of Tolmers Leicester Road, Thornhall in Peterborough. And I will pass this over to our officer Molly Hood to present the application. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chair. So, yes, this is land to the east of Tolmers, Leicester Road in Thornhall. And this slide just demonstrates the site's location in relationship to the existing houses, <coughs> paddocks to the east, and you'll see the main vehicle entrance point, which is included in this red line boundary. These are a few images taken from officer site visit. So you'll be able to see an existing um, grassed area with a village notice board in the middle. This is included in the application site. You'll be able to see in the far of the picture is the vehicle access point off the main A road. And again, another image just showing the existing area. The vehicle route into the settlement. And this image here demonstrates the enlargement of this verge and the grassed area with these posts indicating land boundary. And again, a further image of the site. So if I just run through some of the main considerations of this application. There's an application to register the site as a village green in accordance with section 15, parts 8 and 9 of the Commons Act 2006. The requirement is for the applicant to evidence their ownership and meet the statutory requirements of parts 8 and 9. The applicant has demonstrated land registry documents to declare their ownership of the land and is bringing it forward to be proposed as a village green. It's a rare application in that in, for, the, for the land to voluntarily be made as a village green. <laughs> And it's been brought to committee as the constitution doesn't um, permit the, the approval or, or decision of this application under delegated powers and therefore it's been brought to members to make that decision. So the application is purely for the registration process and it's to decide whether sufficient evidence has been submitted to declare ownership under part 15.8 of the Commons Act 2006. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Molly. We have a speaker on this uh, committee, Martin Witherington. Would you like to come to one of these chairs here, sir, please, so we can use the mic? Thank you. 
either the gentleman either side will show you how to use the mic when you're ready so good afternoon and welcome you have five minutes when you're ready to address committee thank you chair good afternoon chair councillors I've come in in case it's a rather unusual application and I had a bit of a difficulty getting it off the ground to start with but it's gone the full route and I thought you might be interested in uh, purposes directly related to this and a couple of issues that come along with it. Uh, this area once belonged to what they called uh, Thorn the Thornor Estate. The Thornor Estate uh, was lost by the Marquis of Exeter to Stanley Brotherhood in 1931 and having gained it he then sold it off in an auction in the Star Inn in Peterborough. So what you see here and all the land around them remnants. This green, the road, uh, was one small part that was left over and actually belonged to a chap who was related to somebody who originally lived here, but he lived in Oxford, he became ill and decided to sell it off. Now I got to know the guy and he agreed that he would give me this land. In addition to that, he would expand it into the land he owned to the east. So that's why it's wider than it originally was. Now that's had a beneficial effect because the uh, behind here runs what they call the Thornall Wittering Circular Footpath. That footpath is one of two off major road circular footpaths in England. It runs down between the houses and due to other actions it passes along the road you see in front of the bigger buildings on, in the east. Mr Witherington, I'm sorry to stop you. I'm just, I've just noticed some gesticulate. Are you having trouble hearing at the back? I'm just, no, just checking if we can turn the volume up. Just, just bear with us a second, it might be the volume. Is, is there any chance of a little bit more? Oh yeah, we'll put a little speaker on your table, then you can hear it. Okay. Hopefully. Okay, please, yeah, please carry on, sir. Carry on when you're ready. Okay. I'll move nearer, that might help. Yeah, as I said, behind this runs and through this area runs the Thornall Wittering Circular Footpath. Are we still okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's about three and a half miles and there is a junction in this with a southbound footpath that runs down through the road to the A47 and crosses there. Uh, so there's been a series of options over the past uh, I obtained some land behind, improved the footpath through there. This is the last bit of it that we can or I can do anything with. From then on, uh, it's set. So the footpath comes between the two houses. If you look at the big chicken farm area buildings and then move to the left, you'll see there are two semi-detached cottages, then another two with a lane between. That lane runs down to the north and off to Wittering and Thornall. And you can also get to Thornall by going down the road in front of the chicken houses. But the major issue that comes along with this land is that the roadway did not have any form of verge to it. Having persuaded the owner uh, that he could include or should include or asked him to, and he included 10 feet in his fields that he was selling off. That is now going to become a, a footpath way to the side of the road. It includes 10 old apple trees from a historic orchard that was attached to the farm to the west. So all that's going to be cleared out. It's going to be turned into quite an attractive situation and benefit the walkers as well. Um, it's pretty good that the guy decided to give me the land, so I've only faced £1,500 in fees 
to get the thing set up. Uh, so that's where it stands. Uh, I thought I'd give you a rundown on it because you didn't go out there and so you haven't seen exactly the effect of what will be done there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witherington. Uh, members, do you have any questions at all? Yes, Councillor Heather. Thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely commendable actions on behalf of you as, as the, the landowner. I'm just wondering if you'd care to come and live in my village. Um, <laughs> you seem to be very public, publicly spirited, and I, and I really do commend what it is that you're doing here. I have absolutely no objections and, and complete support for this uh, application, I suppose, for want of a better way. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Before I go to debate? No? Well, we'll move. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Witherington. You, you can turn your mic off and you stay there until we make a decision. I'll go back to your seat. It's up to you. Okay, okay we'll go to the debate then. Who would like to kick that off? Councillor Hiller, please. Thank you, Chair. Fully supportive. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Councillor Jones. Well, to use a northern phrase, I'll go to the foot of our stairs. I never knew that, and it's always, this is one of the joys of being on the planning committee, and uh, support Councillor Hiller and indeed this application. Any further debate? So shall we move to a proposal, please? Who would like to register a proposal? Councillor Jones. Um, I'd like to go with officer recommendations to uh, to approve this application, please. Thank you. And the seconder is Councillor Hiller. So that's a valid proposal and it's been seconded, so we'll go to the vote. So all those in favour? That's a unanimous decision, so the application is approved. Thank you very much. Well done. Uh, okay, members, we're moving on to the next item, which is item 4.1, which relates to the land at Horsey Bridge, Wordsley Road in Stanground, and will be presented by uh, Sylvia Bland. Thank you, Sylvia. Okay, thank you, Chairman. This is application 20 slash 01002. It's an outline application for land at Horsey Bridge in Stangground. The proposal itself, as I've said, is an outline planning application and it's one where all matters are reserved except for access to the site. The application proposes a mix of Class E office, Class B2 industrial and Class B8 storage and distribution uses. There would be a maximum of floor space of around 15,000 square metres. There, there will be uh, an additional condition um, as set out in the update report in relation to Class E offices. And I would also take this opportunity to draw your attention to the rest of the update report, where there is an amended recommendation in relation to referral to the Secretary of State, should the committee be minded to approve the application, which I'll explain during the course of the, 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 the presentation. 
There will also be amendments to two conditions, condition 12 and 13, uh, to tie those together. And again, I can go through these in the presentation. And then finally, there has been additional consultation responses from members of the public which are set out in the update report and generally reiterate the concerns that have been already raised and summarised in the report itself. There has been one statement from a member of the public who has been unable to attend committee today and that's set out in full. And then finally, there has been additional correspondence received from the applicant which is summarised in the update report and also refers to a letter that you have been sent directly. So turning back to the application itself, the site allocation, site location plan that you can see in front of you shows a sort of irregular rectangular shaped piece of land that is bounded by the, the River Nin on two sides to the west and to the north, and then also by the A605 to the south. You can see before you two pieces of land, land that is colored in red, that forms the application site. The land that is in blue is land that is within the ownership of the applicant but doesn't form part of the application. And as you'll see, it is set out as an as a archeological preservation area. To the south of the site is a scheduled monument known as Horsey Fort, and that is a protected heritage asset. That part of the site is on higher ground as is the A605, which are elevated above the application site. Now this slide here gives a little bit more about the, the, the planning policy context. So just taking you through that, the, the red line that we have here to the west marks the boundary of the urban area of Peterborough. This is the application site in here this is Horsey Fort, the scheduled monument. And finally, the dotted blue line marks the boundary of Peterborough City Council's administrative area with the land over here within Fendland District. Some photographs show the proximity of the A605. It shows the, the crane depot, which lies uh, beyond the River Nien to the north of the application site. Um, from, from this site, you can see the, the generally flat nature of the topography. And here, another photograph showing the proximity to the A605, and the buildings that you can see just in the distance are within Whittlesea. And the last, last photograph that we have here shows the, the northern boundary showing one of the tributaries of the River Nin, and beyond in this area here, this marks the location of Horsey Fort to the south of the site. As I mentioned before, this is an outline application with only access for consideration and determination today. What you have before you here is an illustrative master plan. So this just shows one way in which the site may be developed in the future. The precise siting and layout of the the internal roads and buildings and car parking areas would be subject to future reserved matters applications. Okay, so one thing to point out to you here is that this is the area that, that is shown as green that would be retained as arable land and would be out with the planning application boundary. There are quite a few material considerations relating to this site and I'm going to take you through these one by one, beginning with the principle of development. So the first thing to draw to your attention is that this site is not allocated for employment development. It's not within the urban area and is located within the countryside. However, the applicant has submitted a number of evidence documents that relate to a review of employment land within Peterborough. And it demonstrates that there is a short supply of land that is allocated for employment use within the local plan. 
and that is because the local plan allocations have been mainly built out, leaving only, leaving only 49.5 hectares of allocated employment land. They have also had a look at the existing employment areas and looked at whether there are any existing brownfield sites within the urban area, and they have found that they are also um, built out and the, the vacancy rate within Peterborough <clears throat> is very low. So, for example, there are sites like to the south of, of Whirlpool and the Greyhound Stadium that are currently subject to planning applications. Just to give you a better idea of the land that has been allocated within the current local plan for employment use, these are split into two main categories, strategic employment sites and then other employment sites. These are of a, a smaller size. Now, the local plan allocates 155 hectares of land. And you'll see under the strategic employment sites that the, the, the bulk of the, the, the land has been allocated within the Gateway Peterborough or the All Walton Hill industrial area and I'm sure committee will be very aware that that large site has been developed out very quickly over the last few years for a mix of industrial and storage and distribution uses. It's part of what makes Peterborough um, part of the, the golden triangle of logistics within the East Midlands. It's, it's a popular location for logistics developments. The, the Hampton site um, which is now being marketed as Kingston Park, that has received planning permission and has been built out. And so of the strategic sites, that just leaves the red brick farm allocation. It has got planning permission for um, just over 50 hectares, so a slightly increased amount than the local plan anticipated, and no development has been built out there as yet. Of the, the other sites um, within the city, you'll see that these are, are much smaller in their scale. And these have either been built out for, for employment or, or for residential, just leaving the, the Oxney Road site. So it's a combination of the, the red brick farm site and the Oxney Road site that leads to there only being 49.5 uh, hectares of employment land currently remaining out of the land that has been allocated within the local plan. Now, in determining this application, committee will need to be mindful of their, their legal duty, as ever, under Section 38 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act, and that sets out that decisions should be made in accordance with the development plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Now, as set out in the report, the identification of a shortage of employment land can be considered to be a material consideration. And it is one that we have given considerable weight to in our recommendation. Uh, and therefore, we have found that the principle of development is acceptable, but subject to detailed site-specific considerations, which I'll come on to in the remainder of the presentation. So the first of these is around highway improvements. Now I've got a number of slides to show you that there will be highway improvements provided as part of this proposal. That will include a priority access um, turning right into the site, the closure of the existing access to the crane depot, which is not considered to be particularly suitable, the creation of a, a, a pedestrian refuge on the A605, and there will also be um, operational improvements such as provision of EV charging points and then during construction, wheel washing and construction management plan conditions. So let's have a look at those highway improvements. The first one would be to provide a new junction from the A605 into the site. And that would be at the, the far eastern end of the site and it would include a right-hand turning lane, therefore enabling the, the smooth access into the site and the prevention of um, excessive queuing on this Class A road. 
And then secondly, at the, the western end of the site, a uh, pedestrian refuge would be provided within the carriageway of the, the A605, and that would enable pedestrians to, to cross from the site to um, any uh, bus stops on the, the opposite side of the site, the details of which are still to be decided. The development would also include a number of active travel improvements as an employment site, it's very important to ensure that it can be accessed by public transport, by cycling and by walking. And the development would include an east-west footway cycleway within the site. And it would also include the extension of footways and cycleways on the A605 in order to join up that new footway to existing footways within the, the highway network. Our highway engineers have also asked for an improvement to the formalised connection of the footway cycleway onto the green wheel, which we saw on, on site, uh, that goes under the A605, and improved cycle route signage. And having considered the, the, the traffic generation, the mitigation provided, there would be no objections from the, our highways officer. Looking at landscape and visual impact, um, a, a proper assessment has been carried out by the applicant. It shows that the, the site, while it's in the, the, the countryside, can be described as a sort of settlement edge transition zone or an urban edge type of, uh, type of setting, um, where it's immediately adjacent to the built up area and then there are other um, built up features within the landscape, such as the crane depot or um, wind turbines that we can see furthermore in the distance. The, the assessment has shown that the, the landscape and visual effects of this development would be very much localised to the, the immediate surrounding area. Nevertheless, we would attach a condition to ensure that building heights are restricted to a maximum of 13.2 metres and with an eave height of 15.5 metres. sorry, 10.5 metres. And the, the development would be um, laid out in a way and controlled to ensure that long distance views of the cathedral is, are maintained and that soft landscaping would be provided. So just to show you this in a bit more detail, we can see here that from, from this point, views towards the cathedral, and I have to say they are very much in the distance, could be achieved by having a break in development in this area. I've got some photographs now of, of, of the site looking from the residential properties at Framlingham Road. This is the, the area there with a the site in the background. You can see the, the location of the houses and the existing footpath. And then this is also a view from the houses at Toll Cottage, which face the application site on the other side of the A605. And the illustrative master plan shows here that from the houses at Fram Framlingham Road, there would be an area of enhanced landscaping along the western boundary of the site. To the houses at Toll Cottage, there would be landscaping al along this part of the A605. There would also be further landscaping within the site here at the eastern end. And there would also, also be scope for some landscaping to the northern side of the archaeological preservation area here and within the car parking area. And as this land is within the ownership of the applicant, there would be scope to include screening along the boundary of the A605 So looking at the heritage impacts, Horsey Hill Fort, this is a, a, a fortification that dates back to Civil War times, that is a, a scheduled monument. The proposed development would have no impact on the monument itself, it's on the other side of the A605, 
but it would have an impact on the setting of that monument. A number of archaeological investigations have been carried out on the site, both in 2008 and more recently in 2001-2002, and that has produced a number of, um, of, of finds. So these relate to different ages as well. Um, so there, what, what the archaeological investigations have found is evidence of a mid-Bronze Age ditch defined closure that is a, a ditch together with ramparts um, also late bronze age and late iron age posts that um that would for would have formed a causeway across what would have been lower lying more waterlogged land next to the river Nin, and also evidence of a, a roman causeway and um, one thing to bear in mind here is that th those deposits have been found because they have been well preserved as the site is, is waterlogged and it is below the water table. So just to give you some further detail on these issues. So this is a, a, a photograph which shows a view northeast and in this area here you can see the extent of the Horsey Hill Fort and how it is on higher ground. Therefore, this area forms part of the, the setting of that, of that fort, um, part of the hinterland of the, the, the area it's intending to, to protect against any um, invasion. Looking at the archaeology, so um, but before the current archaeological works were, were carried out, there already was some information known about this site. So we, we had known about uh, a ditch, a Bronze Age ditch in this area here, uh, and also some, some clay remains in, in this area. The, the new trial trenching that was done, so physical excavation on the ground, are, are shown by these symbols here. And what they have found um, is a further extent of the ditch. So we knew about this bit here, but also the ditch running in this, following this alignment. And you'll recall that this follows quite closely the archaeological preservation area that are set out that excludes this area from development and outside the red line of the application. The investigation also found um, remains of posts that um, formed causeways across the wet ground and I actually have a more detailed slide here that hopefully you can see this is the alignment of the the later Bronze Age posts the Iron Age posts and then the, the Roman causeway here and some idea of what that looks like you can see from from these photographs you can see the posts are are well below ground so by way of, of, of mitigation, this area here has been identified uh, as an area where further archaeological investigation um, should be carried out to, to, to further um, conclude the investigations that have been done to identify the line of the ditch and the rampart. So in total, um, a num quite a number of heritage mitigations are proposed in order to ensure that the heritage assets are, are, are preserved or um, protected from, from any harm from the development. The, the first that I've mentioned is the archaeological preservation area where an entire area of the site would be free from development and that would ensure the preservation of the area of the ditch and the rampart. And it would also mean that an area within the setting of the scheduled monument um, would also be preserved. As I mentioned, we have a condition that would require the evaluation of the, the line of the ditch and rampart further. That's condition 16. And a further condition that would seek to preserve the the, the waterlogged posts and to maintain the, the water table. That's condition 15. And then linked to that, 
um, because it's it, it's important to ensure that the 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 drainage of the site from buildings and and from the impact of trees within the site and the preservation of the archaeology all work well together. We would also add uh, an additional condition C13 that would ensure that the the landscape screening along the 605, which I mentioned, would be proposed doesn't um, mean that the trees would um, lead to the, the dewatering of this part of the site. And then we have a final condition that would ensure that um, any other areas that weren't already covered by the previous conditions are evaluated. Now, as a result of this mitigation, Historic England have no objections to the proposals and the council's conservation, sorry, the council's archaeological officer also has no objections. The Historic England have identified that there would be an impact on the setting of the, the fort purely by virtue of bringing new development within it, it, the area of its setting. Uh, we have concluded that that would be of less than substantial harm to the, to the significance of those heritage assets. And that's also um, corroborated by Historic England. So looking at neighbour amenity, there, there have been a lot of objections to this application. Looking at neighbour amenity in particular, the types of issues raised by local residents, uh, for example, relating to noise, to potential for reversing alarms from um, delivery and servicing vehicles, um, the, the timing of deliveries, impact of external lighting and landscape screening could all be addressed by way of planning conditions. And on that basis, there have been no objections from environmental health. Looking at biodiversity, there, th th this is not an area of high biodiv biodiversity or nature conservation interest. However, we do propose a number of conditions relating to, to badgers, to protection of barn owls and a construction environmental management plan. And there have been no objections from Natural England or the Council's wildlife officer as a result. So looking um, finally at drainage, this is in flood zone one, therefore there's no objection from the Environment Agency. The Internal Drainage Board, they require a 20 meter maintenance strip along their, their waterways, which can be achieved. The Council's drainage officer, after looking at information submitted by the applicant, raises no objections. And again, drainage matters will be covered by detailed conditions requiring um, sustainable drainage scheme, um, during that the, the drainage features are, are properly maintained. I've referred previously to the, the highway works and the section 106 agreement would be entered into with the applicant should the application be approved and that would ensure that a, an adoptable footway cycleway across the site can be provided and that the off-site uh, active travel improvements that I described can be achieved. So in conclusion, look, looking at the planning balance, weighing, weighing up the benefits and, and issues of harm arising from this development and, and thinking about the, the statutory requirement to make a decision in accordance with the development plan unless, ma unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Uh, as officers, we conclude that the local plan policies have been shown by the evidence provided by the, the applicant that the employment land supply figures are, are out of date in that there is a shortage of employment land for the remaining years of the local plan period. Now in this situation, the NPPF says that planning permission should be granted unless there's a clear reason for refusal or that adverse impacts significantly and demonstrably out be harm to the setting of the scheduled monument that would be of a level that is less than substantial and in that situation the council should apply the NPPF test 
um, of whether that harm would be outweighed by the benefits of the proposals. And in the case of this application, we consider that there are benefits, the economic benefits from providing employment development and, and to a more limited extent, the improved footway cycleway provision that would outweigh the less than substantial harm to the heritage asset. Therefore, we recommend that planning permission is granted subject to the completion of a Section 106 agreement and to the suggested conditions as amended by the update report. But this is providing that the application is not called in by the Secretary of State um, on account of the amount of office development outside of the town centre. Now, I would say this is a more of a precautionary approach that we are taking as it's envisaged that the, the office use is more likely to be ancillary to the, the um, industrial and storage and distribution uses. Over to you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Sylvia. Okay, we have four persons registered to speak on this item. Um, before I go any further, though, committee, um, I've been, again, approached to allow a little bit more time, being as the amount of public interest in this um, item. So I have agreed with your agreement to um, each side having 10 minutes to address you. Are, are you all in favour of that? Yes? Okay, thank you very much. Right, so firstly I will call uh, Councillor Rush, please, who's one of the ward councillors. Would you like to take a seat, Councillor Rush? Okay. Are you okay there? Yep, yep, okay, you're fine there. Uh, Councillor Rush, you have 10 minutes when you're ready to address the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members and officers, for giving me the opportunity to address you today. I speak to you today in my capacity as a ward councillor for Stangground South Ward against the application and on behalf of the many residents of Stangground who are against this application. I do understand that economic growth and job creation are important, but in, in the right area. This part of Stangground and the areas known not only Cardia, but also Park Farm and Toll Elks Cottages lie close to the application site forming the boundary of the Peter Urban Area Boundary. <clears throat> the site falls close to the Peter Fence Landscape Character Area and moves across to the Neen Washes and falls within the Flagfen Basin on Greenbelt land and is close to the Mush Farm Heritage Site, which was built on the old course of the river and flown to the Horsey Toll Fort and across open landscape, probably to Flagfen. This area is of considerable archaeological significance and archaeological remains have been found in the area. Recent excavations near the site have unearthed wooden posts which were probably part of the causeway from Mus Farm to Horsey Toll. There is no clear evidence why this site has been chosen for this development when the land is not allocated for development in the local plan. In their letter to the Planning Department, Historic England give a trial trenching evaluation. The archaeological trial trenching established the presence of highly significant waterlogged buried archaeological remains at the application site, well preserved wooden posts dating to the Late Bronze Age and Late Iron Age, crossing the hollow embayment between Orsi Hill and Stangground. They go on to say that the piles would, would likely terminate in the Oxford clay formation, which means they will cut through the water-bearing soils and this could impact the groundwater flow or levels. Historic England maintains its concerns about the application on the heritage grounds. The additional information of high significance buried remains at the site has not satisfactorily demonstrated they could be effectively be preserved in situ. The planting of trees for screening would adversely affect the hydrology of the site and potential result in the drying out of the current important waterlogged burial buried archaeological remains. This does not mean meet NPPF paragraphs 194 and 195. The proposed development would have an adverse effect on the setting of the Orsi Hill Fort and cause harm to its significance. Once the buried archaeological remains are buried beneath the proposed buildings, there would be no opportunity to record them through excavation to see if the remains were being adversely affected. The tree officer objects on arbicultural and landscape grounds. 
He says, I do not believe the site can be adequately or appropriately landscaped to offer both the screening and enhancement required of the development site. Given the overdevelopment of the site in relation to the numerous constraints on and adjacent to the site, the application is through with regard to local plans LP 16, 17 and 27. The landscape and especially tree, edge and shrub planting adjacent to the preservation area will almost certainly contribute to the drying out or desiccation of the soil. Middle level commission object as it contravenes their byways and is considered would affect navigation, aquatic environment, water level and flood risk, risk management. Dr. Rebecca Kaser Hatton, the Peterborough Council archaeologist. In a letter to the planning department, she says, in light of Historic England's recommendations and the tree officer's consultation response, I object to the current application on the ground of the archaeology. The additional information submitted to support the progress has not proposal has not satisfactorily satisfactorily demonstrated that the significant significant buried archaeological and paleo environment remains identified at the site can be effectively preserved in situ in the long term. The site is of a national importance. The access road has the potential to impact upon the Bronze Age earthworks. In a letter to me, Kate Woods tries to answer my objections. Transport. This development will bring extra traffic onto an already busy road. In Edison report it says, we are aware of concerns about the traffic associated with Stangrand and Cardia at junctions from Whittlesea Road leading into these estates. Unfortunately, it is not physically possible for the application to solve problems that already exist. Viability, visibility of the scheme. It has never been assumed that a new development would have no impact at all. By its very nature, it will change the appearance of the site on which it is located. It goes on to say that it would be a shame if I, if I uh, went against this development and it doesn't go ahead. Not a shame that it will affect local residents. It's not a shame they will destroy archaeological remains. A review of available allocated employment land was undertaken. Who did the review? Edison's Barker, Story Matthews, the agents, on behalf of Barnacles. <coughs> Barnica states, <coughs> the applicants, how <coughs> biased can you get? Application 22. <coughs> Councillor Rush, hold on, I'll get you a glass yeah, of water. Can you drop a water, please. I'm going to take it from here. <coughs> Resume when you're ready. Langer Chair. Sorry, Councillor, hold on, Councillor. Uh, yes, um, Councillor Hillis, could you start that paragraph again for us, please? Which bit, the viability or the... Oh, right, right, I'll start again. In the letter to me, Kate Wood Edison's tries to answer my objections. Transport, this development will bring extra traffic onto an already busy road. In Edison's report, it says, we are aware of concerns about traffic associated with Stangground and Cardia at junctions from the Whittlesea Road leading into these estates. Unfortunately, it's not physically possible for the application to solve problems that already exist. Visibility of the scheme. It is never to be assumed that a new development would have no impact at all. By its very nature, it would change the appearance of the site on which it is located. It goes on to say that it would be a shame if this development doesn't go ahead. Not a shame this will affect local residents. It's not a shame they will destroy archaeological remains. A review of, a review of available and allocated employment land was undertaken. Who did the review? Edison's Barker Story Matthews, the agents, on behalf of Barnock Estates Limited, the applicants. How biased can you get? Application 2201699 full, Greyhound Stadium, 12,000 square metres of employment land on Brownfield site. Application 2201345, 
outline land to the south of Oxney Road, 22,000 metres of employment land. Newlands Development Application on the A1, this comes under Hunts District Council, would provide 4,000 jobs, 230 square metres of employment. Have, 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 have these schemes been taken into account in the officer's determination that there is insufficient identified employment land in the city? Highway matters. The A605 is already a busy route and is made worse when the North Bank Road is closed. The entrance is near visually impaired bends on the A605. The local highways authority has assessed existing and forecast traffic flow submitted by the applicant. Where is this evidence that shows that the A605 can withstand more traffic and when and at what time was the survey carried out? In the report it states that there appears to be a need to carry out more out work outside the application site in order to access the site, as consent being given by the landowner. Under a principle of development, under this item it says the application site had previously been allocated for development as part of a regional freight interchange, but that no longer carries any weight. Also relevant is the site is covered by minerals safeguard and area for brick clay extraction, with the western part of the site also safeguarded for sand and gravel extraction within the minerals and waste local plan. What's happened to the point of the plan if it can be just torn up and ignored? As I said earlier, this land is not allocated for employment land in the local plan. What's the point of having the local plan if you don't adhere to it? Planning policies and decisions should contribute to enhance the natural environment. This is a specific historic site and should not be devalued. It is too close to established properties and is not allocated in the local plan. This will mean the statutory plan has been abandoned. If this application goes through, other developers will pursue projects because agreeing on this application will set a precedent. What's the point of spending many years, time and money, on a local plan if it is not adhered to? If this application is granted, it will open floodgates to other developers to build, build um, what they want in the next three years until there is a new revised local plan. Members, it could be in your ward next. There have been 304 objections out of 206 responsibilities against this application. Summing up, land not allocated in the local plan, land within the adopted minerals and waste local plan, hydrology impact of routing, tree officer objection, middle level commission objection, archaeologist causes concerns, damage to archaeological remains, historic England concerns on heritage grounds, access roads damaging Bronze Age earthworks, entrance onto busy A605 near Benz, close to established housing. You have one chance to save important archaeological remains and save the importance of a local plan. Please vote to refuse this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Rush. Uh, members, do you have any questions for Councillor Rush, please? No. Sorry, councillor, did you put your hand? Yes, councillor. Yeah, but thank, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for that address, councillor Rush. You mentioned three um, current, at least I think you mentioned three current applications that have uh, are, are, are awaiting decision. One of those, of course, is, is Huntingdonshire District Council, the other side of the A1, although very, very close to Peterborough, um, you mentioned a figure of 230 square metres. Was that an accurate figure? It seems very small to me. I think that was the Newlands, what, 230,000. Oh, I see, sorry. So, uh, 230,000 square metres right. on the Newland site, 12,000 square metres on the Greyhound site, and 22,000 square metres on the Oxney Road site. And, and these are all for employment? Yeah. Uh, th right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rush. Uh, thank you. Anybody else got a question at all? No, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rush.
We'll now move on to uh, other speakers. Can I call then Mr. Richardson and Mr. Hodgson, please, to come to the chairs here, if you would, please. Yes, committee, you'll have to crick your neck to ask a question. Sorry about that. Okay, just, just bear with me a minute before you start to speak. Um, <coughs> Mr. Richardson and Mr. Hodson, as you speak, could you please identify which one of you is which? I'm Mr. Richardson. Yeah, and also you have 10 minutes, uh, this has been agreed by the committee between you, <coughs> to address committee. So as uh, soon as you start, that, that clock will begin, and it's up to you how you use the time. So welcome <coughs> to the meeting, and away you go. Mr. Richardson first. With only a little more than 1% of the proposed development excavated for archaeological investigation, a survey is only a guide, and with the purpose 90% coverage of the site in buildings, concrete proposed coverage, 90% coverage of the site in buildings, concrete, block pavement and tarmac, of which some 30% will be subject to the driving in of 546 piles, would it not be wise in view of the national importance of who held by all experts and possible scheduling by Historic England of the site to delay any planning decisions by refusal at this stage? as there is so, still so much to be discovered in the remaining 99%. The 90% hard covering of this site would make the archaeology completely inaccessible forever, Councillor Rush, to any archaeological investigation with no chance of reversal, another view held by all the experts, lost for all time. The 30% piled area would be all but totally destroyed of its archaeology and never accessible, not even to Durham miners. A sectional drawing produced to no doubt convey the impre impression that the archaeology would be completely saved gives a, an untrue, false impression. Unless the site due to be covered is fully excavated, assessed and recorded, this is not possible. The only option is a full dig. There is also, of course, also the problem, should the area be near totally covered, of how to guarantee the preservation of the timbers which are at present managed by the open field system of rain penetration through the soil and the high water table. Historic England and others quite rightly believe that by the near total hard coverage of the site and the driving of the piles into the Oxford clay, the area will be subject to water loss and drying out. The archaeology would be destroyed. Should the development be allowed to go ahead, it would be impossible impossible to check for any possible decay rot of the timbers later again not even the durham miners whatever this site is unique a valuable asset to peterborough other points quite how the highways department came to the conclusion they did is beyond many the proposed entrance sits only meters from a long abandoned entrance exit onto the a605 not used because of its difficulty in particular of exiting safely particularly towards the direction of peterborough i've tried it near impossible the slightest of incidents works even to, from some distance away causes major hold-ups queues, particularly when the north bank is closed. Terrible. Along this section of road, and, they're very, and they are very regular, photos supplied. There will be hold-ups, long queues, accidents, even fatalities. Remember these words. At present, there is a peace, perfect peace scenario allowing the road, along, allowing the road traffic from the proposed site. site. This will will certainly disappear with the proposed factory estate, as it did with the bedlam caused with the Horsey Bridge Works. Voices, banging of vehicle doors, beep beep, or that of other, other racket of reversing vehicles, which was consist, constant. And that was only during the daytime. It will now be continuous, and the factories are nearer. Will we ever be able to sleep? Ever. The night time will disappear. We will have no evening or night, irrespective of what lighting is used, 
are demonstrated with photos too plain in the proposed areas as it now is, is now blessed with of darkness. The heights of the buildings could well end up a metre approximately higher than claimed. If as stipulated, the measurements are taken from slab height and the construction of the buildings is above existing ground level on, say, beams to clear the archaeology fully and not set at existing land levels. This will affect the view considerably from the fort and even the loss of the World War II hurricane hangar. Historic England are opposed quite rightly to the aspects of tree planting. The tree officer points out the screening is adequate. Both are right. The only solution is no development. The planning department have imposed some great decisions, but sadly they are not enough. Finally, the city of Peterborough nationally has too much to lose by allowing this development. The early history, bronze, Iron Age and Roman are almost certainly part of the birth of Peterborough. Planning needs to be refused. Once covered, lost forever. And I note also that there are at least in excess of over 100 available for, to rent commercial buildings in Peterborough at present. Hence, why, why, the, why, you know, why the urgency or the claim by Barnaker states that, that, that we're running out of them. I see that the developer has also shown a photo of the other archaeological field opposite to where, he is, where they are at the moment proposing to develop. Does he want to destroy this as well? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hodgson, yeah. It's flashing. There you go. It's flashing. It's flashing. It's flashing. You use this oh, it's on there. It's on. Yeah. I'm using the button. Is this one working? Yes. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Stephen Hodson. I'm a retired chartered survey and planning consultant, and I live in Whittlesey. Now, interesting application. Several questions, principally around highways. My colleagues have here mentioned uh, the comments made by highways. I believe they've said in the reports that the 605 is capable of extra traffic. Are highways represented today? Anybody here from highways? Yes. Oh, good. I'll have a chat with you later. Um, you perhaps weren't here years ago when the bridge was planned at Kings Dyke. But the local highway authority said at that time, and it must be six or seven years ago, that the 6, 605 is already surcharged. This is my experience. My house fronts the 605, and I've been there almost 40 years. Traffic has increased, particularly heavy lorries. And when North Bank is flooded, as our colleagues said, the traffic is nose to tail. The thing that puzzles me, and I'm pleased why our ways are here, the estate road connection is bent. Should it not be straight? And if the site was, uh, we're only talking about the access, of course, the layout of the site could be uh, altered to accommodate a straight in access. Um, also, lorries from the tower crane site, I'm pretty sure, are longer than the 16.5 uh, Arctic used in the application. Again, with that bent access, it would be very awkward to get out, especially once the traffic is flowing as it often does continuously. My view would be the roundabout would be a solution there. Some of you may know about the problems that we've had in Whittlesea with industrial development at Saxon Pit, a former London brick development. Lots of problems with lorries there, but we have negotiated with three of the owners that their vehicles should only come from the west and not go through town. Now there's a truism in life that service above self is a good role model. So I challenge this committee either today or when they 
discuss reserve matters and Barnack Estates, when they develop this, should they get permission, that they have all lorry movements coming from the west and not from the east. So the present upset that's caused by all the traffic that goes east through King's Dyke and through Whittlesea will be at least alleviated. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hodson. Okay, members, do you have any questions at all for Mr. Richardson or Mr. Hodson? Yes, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Hodson. Um, interesting. Are you suggesting that the development go ahead, but with the traffic? Are you supportive of it if there was a roundabout and the traffic coming from the west? Or, you know, your service above self is applied to the whole of, the, of that development that it should or shouldn't go ahead? I'm just not quite clear, please. It seems to me that the development will go ahead. However, there should be conditions with regard to traffic because that's going to be the biggest problem for folk around there and for others travelling on the road. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor. Would you be, uh, given, given your former career, would you be supportive of it going ahead? Well, not when, when I've heard all the already available industrial land. I must say, Peterborough slipped up when they did their plan by not allocating enough industrial land. That's the fact of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anybody else got any questions at all? Yes, Councillor Sharp. Again. Uh, Mr. Richardson, I think you, you made mention about concerns about the junction as, as proposed or as revised in terms of an accident, black spot, and, and so on. Can you just expand on what your concerns are with it? I just wonder if you could expand on your concerns around the, the revised access point. Well, I just in terms of in terms of accident, black spot, etc. As you come. Um, well, as I stated, the the, the proposed entrance is. A, within metres of a, of, a, of a drop curb section, which, if you like, was abandoned or hasn't been used for years because to, to access across from the, particularly across the road in the direction of Peterborough, within view of the, con the constant flow of traffic, is now impossible. Uh, it, it, it just, it, and I've tried it. Sorry, is that, is that what you're wanting to know? The access point is in the wrong place. It should not be there. I don't know where the hell you're going to put it because that road is dangerous. It is damn dangerous. And the traffic is, is a constant flow. And as I say, as it's been pointed out, when you get the, uh, the North Bank closed, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. Any, any simple incident along that road, whatever it may be, even, even we were just recently had some works, uh, the works at, uh, in King's Delph, the, the, the queue was backing right up to Horsey Bridge within, within, within minutes. It, 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 it just, it's just it's a horrendous piece of road, uh, yet, and, to, and yet to put an, a, a crossing, to put a junction on. Sorry. No, OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll it, refer I mean, it back it, to, it to the office. It is bad. I mean, I, I, live, I actually live at, uh, uh, at Tollbar Cottage, the old, the old, to, um, old Toll Cottage. Well, it looks more like a bungalow nowadays, but it's a, So I know, we experienced the traffic down there. I mean, getting, getting out of my place, at uh, uh, the best of times, at uh, peak times, it, it, you just forget it. You just, you, I, we just don't bother no more, because we can sit there for ages, and nobody will let you out. And then, as I say, if, if you get anybody, any here, here. Slight, in, slight incident, slight, any slight incident, whatever it may be, a, a, a vehicle stopped, any, any works whatsoever, it, it just backs totally up. To, so to, to, to place a junction at that particular point is just, to me, plain stupid. Okay, okay, anybody else? Any questions? Right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks for addressing the committee. We return to your seats. Okay.
So could, could you also return, return to your seat as well? Yes, please. So, so the speaker's going to take your place, you see. OK, uh, if I could call, please, uh, Kate Wood, please, the agent. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I'll address you as Miss Wood, if that, that's okay, uh, as I don't know, either way. Perfect, thank you. Um, um, okay, welcome to committee. Uh, as I afforded and committee agreed to 10 minutes maximum for those in objection, you too now will be uh, accorded the same amount of time if you wish to take it, the 10 minutes, so when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and members, uh, and thank you, Sylvia, for that very comprehensive presentation. Um, we appreciated you attending last Friday's committee site inspection and reading the letter that, that I sent yesterday morning. I'm accompanied today by the chairman of Barnack Estates and his team. Barnack is a regional development company based in Peterborough, which is owned by its staff as an employment ownership trust, a bit like John Lewis. Um, it has specialised in building warehousing and industrial units at SME size, small and medium enterprise, uh, for over 20 years in Peterborough and can therefore be trusted to deliver high quality and sustainable development in a timely manner. Uh, just wanted to point out the site is not in the green belt. The application was submitted in May 2021, following months of work on the proposals and supporting information prior to and following pre-application discussions in 2020. Following submission of the application, almost two years ago, there were over 200 objections from local residents, as well as requirements for additional or amended information from your technical consultees. This is not unusual for a scheme of this nature and size. In the following two years, the applicant has liaised, consulted and altered the scheme, recognising the input from ward councillors, local residents, officers and their consultees. This site was previously allocated as part of a wider site for a rail freight terminal in the previous local plan. The Council has announced the current local plan is to be reviewed prior to its end date of 2036. That work will take some years. And in the meantime, the current local plan has effectively been a victim of its own success in that just about all the employment lands allocated for new development has been taken up along with space on existing employment sites in the designated general employment areas. You will have seen from the employment land review, its 2022 updates and the review of GEA availability, all on, the, all on your website, that very little land remains undeveloped um, or which is not the subject of a current planning application, as has been pointed out already. Meanwhile, demand remains extremely high. By way of example, the applicant has such a strong reputation that at its development just over the border in Huntingdonshire, in Yaxley, many units have been sold or rented before construction has even started, which just shows how much demand there is for SME units in the, otherwise, uh, in the Peterborough area. It is essential that there's a pipeline of sites coming forwards to be built out Otherwise, businesses will not be able to establish or grow in the Peterborough City Council area. As I said in yesterday's letter, Red Brick Farm has incurred some delay, adding further to the risk of a gap in supply of employment development. It is important to understand that there's a long lead in time for sites to produce units for occupation, even once they are allocated in a local plan. In this case, should outline consent be granted, it will be late this year by the time we've discharged conditions and submitted reserved matters applications. Construction, hopefully early 2024, for first occupations later that year. That represents a four to five year timescale from early work to occupation and is not untypical of development timescales. So you can see why having a pipeline of deliverable and sustainable sites is so important to maintain the supply of units to meet demand. Local plan policy LP1 replicates government advice and planning law. 
which requires applications to be determined in accordance with the local plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The issues I've just set out regarding employment, land supply and demand are material considerations which allow the council to consider granting planning permission. In terms of residential amenity, the scheme has been amended during the application process to remove the access back to the eastern end of the site, away from the neighbouring occupiers opposite. There are several conditions recommended to protect neighbouring amenity, which have been set out in the officer presentation. These relate to nighttime noise levels, reverse beeps, traffic management, lighting and landscaping. These all ensure that local concerns are protected. Technical matters, highways, your highway officers no longer object to the application on highway grounds. The application was accompanied by a transport assessment which provides hard evidence. This looks at the capacity of the roads to accommodate safely the amount of traffic that would result from the development and using the junction. Early objections to the application were submitted by residents when the Ponders Bridge Road improvement project was still under construction. Now it's been completed, so traffic flows more freely, as you will have seen on your committee site visit on Friday. In order to keep traffic flowing, a right turn lane will be built into the middle of the road outside the site entrance, so that traffic towards Peterborough is not held up, wait, is, does not hold up vehicles waiting to continue. Highway officers have agreed that the capacity of the road and junction and have agreed them and approved the design of the access and the circulation within the site, which includes a footway cycleway route as well. At present, there are only 21 trees on the site. We've proposed a comprehensive landscape strategy, which includes a significant number of new trees and hedges to be planted at key locations throughout the development as set out in Sylvia's uh, presentation and including along Whittlesea Road. This will ensure screening of the buildings and improve the visual amenity of the site for neighbours and occupiers, as well as ecological protection and enhancement. The significance of the archaeology of the site is understood. The applicants have spent over £100,000 on archaeological investigation to date and will be required to spend another half million pounds to preserve the archaeology as part of the development. As you know, a large part of the site area is now to be left completely undeveloped, as this is the most important area incorporating a former ditch. The root of the ditch is not possible to see at ground level on the site at present, but the development area will follow its edge and therefore help define its position above ground to assist understanding and interpretation. Leaving this part of the site undeveloped will highlight the significance of the war fort and its setting. The work that's been carried out to date has found that there are rows of deeply buried posts which are associated with ancient walkways across the site. We've designed the foundations for buildings around these posts and have designed the drainage strategy to ensure that the hydrology of the site maintains a high water table to continue to preserve those posts. If you're concerned, condition C3 requires a phasing plan. So while concerns have been raised about hydrology arrangements and whether they'll be successful, development can take place in a phased way so that any issues that become known regarding hydrology can be assessed and mitigated before the site is built out. Archaeology is, is to be protected by very strictly worded conditions, 15, 16 and 17. The buried posts can be retained in areas between the buildings rather than beneath them. Remember, this is an outline application. The master plan is illustrative only. As you will see from the committee report, officers are now uh, in agreement that the application proposals have overcome earlier objections, subject to strict conditions and a section 106 agreement, which we accept. This includes the additional condition 41 in the update sheet. The proposals incorporate extensive sustainability interventions, such as energy and water consumption, and the use of PV panels and electric vehicle charging points, which are required to be implemented by conditions 18 and 29. 
there'll also be a section 106 contribution to the wider green wheel route. The development will bring about significant economic benefits, supporting around 62 construction jobs over a four-year build programme, followed by 412 permanent jobs once the development is occupied. The development will add around 15.7 million to the local economy during construction, followed by an estimated 21.8 million added to the economy each year following occupation of the development. In particular, the, gen the, de the development will generate around 13.8 million in employee wages and annual business rates of 274,000. In conclusion, we have listened and consulted extensively, adapting the application and addressing, most notably, archaeology and highway concerns to provide a sustainable development that would bring significant employment opportunities to Peterborough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wood. Um, committee, do you have any questions, please? Councillor Sharp. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, you, you mentioned in your in your uh, statement uh, hard it related to hard evidence contained in the transport assessment plan. I wonder if you could just expand on that hard evidence a little bit further for me, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Through you, the um, the transport assessment um, is is required to consider the likely um, traffic that will arise from a development of no this nature. And I'm kind of looking towards highway officers because they're the experts. But basically, um, uh, there's there's a, a database called the Trix database, and that is a database of all. Um, not all, but uh, similar developments that have taken place throughout the country. And transport consultants consult that database and they can use, um, they can use that in relation to this site to model the traffic that will arise from it. Um, and then they can extrapolate from that what will happen in the peak hours, which obviously everyone is most concerned about. So they can calculate uh, what the um, traffic will be associated with that. And that's widely accepted by highway authorities around the country. Um, so that's, that is effectively the hard evidence. In addition to that, um, they've also carried out um, speed, uh, speed surveys on the road um, to, to set the baseline as it is at the moment. So they know what the traffic is on the road at the moment and obviously that's had to be updated because when the when the road improvements were done then matters changed um so they don't you know, the, those experts don't come out with wild comments you know they base they base their observate they base it on observations uh modeling and then they can say this is what will happen this is the traffic that will arise um and this is the capacity of the road and the local junctions to be able to accommodate it. Thank you. Councillor Hither. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Kate. Uh, you mentioned in your address that um, the, 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 there should be a, a, a healthy pipeline of deliverable sites. Would, would you uh, not reflect on what Councillor Rush has mentioned um, and agree that there is actually is a, a healthy pipeline of deliverable sites. He mentioned the 22,000 square metres of employment land at uh, Oxney Road, uh, 12,000, I've written it down as he was speaking, 12,000 um, square metres of employment land at the Greyhound, the old Greyhound track, 230,000 square metres of employment land, albeit Hunts District Council, I get that, but it will directly impact Peterborough. And of course, I would suggest the vast majority of those workers in that site, when it's actually up and running, should it be approved, uh, would probably come from Peterborough. So it would be putting back from economic wages terms. I just want your thoughts on that, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Well, the A1 West site um, doesn't appear to be going too far as, at the moment. Um, so we can't rely on that. Um, certainly, uh, as Peterborough, you can't rely on that to provide your employment requirements. Um, 
the other sites, uh, yes, allocated sites, you know, we've, we've done these surveys of the general employment areas, we've looked at the allocated sites uh, in 2021, and then we updated it in 2022, and we can see a trend in all these sites coming forward, being the subject of planning applications, being approved, being built out. Now, because of, uh, you know, I talked about specifically the lead-in time for these to happen, because once it gets to the planning application stage, it's gone through quite a lot already. Then it has to get permission. And then, you know, if they get permission this year and are, and are then, you know, built out, what have you got left? And so you, you absolutely have to keep these, these pipeline jobs coming through. Um, otherwise, yes, it's fair to say that um, there'll come a point where you don't have any allocated sites that haven't already got planning permission uh, and are there ready to be built out. Uh, thank, thank you for that. You, you also mentioned uh, the employment land review. Is, is that the report that your firm has done for Barnack Estates, it, it, a commercial report? Uh, yes, it was carried out by Edison's uh, and also Savills uh, contributed to that because that looked into um, the availability and demand for land. So um, Edison's and Savills are the main agents uh, for commercial property. So um, they have a, a good idea of what demand there is what people they have on their books looking for sites or buildings. Uh, and so that was uh, useful to assess the demand. Uh, it was commissioned by Barnack Estates. Um, but you'll notice that in the Employment Land Review and the 2022 update, it doesn't mention this site because it's actually, the purpose of it is to um, inform the council um, as to the situation um, obviously, we use it to support our case, but ultimately it, it has helped the council to appreciate the situation, and that's why the council has instructed a review, well, probably not entirely why, but that's, <laughs> the council has instructed a review of the local plan, um, partly because this, this has highlighted um, a problem coming up in, uh, in the next few years. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, with your permission, Chair, that rather neatly brings me on to my next question which is the local plan um, you, you it, it appears that the foundation for the the deviation that you want officers to take from the conditions of the local plan the policies of the local plan is is based pretty much fundamentally on the lack of employment sites available until the end of the current plan 2036 now that is is part question but the fact that the local plan is being revised over the next two to three years, that must surely encourage you um, that other sites, perhaps even through your good offices, uh, will be put forward for a revision of the local plan when it's revised. Absolutely, Chairman. You know, this won't be the last proposal that comes forward. Ultimately, though, a local plan review takes some time. Unless you do a single issue review, uh, if you're reviewing the actual whole local plan, um, then that does take years to come to, to fruition. Um, you have various stages in the local plan where you have issues and options. It's not just about employment, it's about housing, it's about all the other things. Um, then uh, there are several rounds of consultation. You need enough staff in your local plan policy department to actually write a draft plan and support it through. It needs to be submitted to the Secretary of State for examination in public. Uh, that is run by the planning inspectorate who also are struggling at the moment with being able to uh, provide inspectors to, uh, to run local plan inquiries. Once they've had the inquiry, which can run on for some months, uh, then, it, uh, then it has to um, be reported back by the inspector to the council and then the council has to debate it and decide whether to adopt it. So it's not really two to three years that we're looking at. Uh, thank you for that comprehensive response, um, Kate. I've, I've sat through three local plans, so um, I'm well aware of the timescale and the, the hoops that the council has to jump through, but, but thank you very much for reminding me. Um, you also said that your uh, commercial report that you'd written for um, 
Barnegar Estates didn't include this particular site um, in the report. Did it include the other sites that have been mentioned um, in the report, the, the sites that Councillor Rush mentioned, um, Oxney Road, Greyhound? Um, did, did it mention those at all or take those into consideration? Sorry, yes, uh, it did. It, it, it looked at all the allocated sites. So those sites that you've mentioned are allocated sites. Just one final question. When was the report submitted, the latest report? Uh, so the original economic land review was May 21. It was updated June 22. And then we also did, uh, at the request of the planning officer, a review of the GEAs. Um, but even since then, you'll see from my letter yesterday, things have moved on with Red Brick Farm. So, you know, applications have come in subsequently to that. It's a constantly moving situation. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to bring Silver in to make a point. Members, go ahead. Um, Councillor Hiller, I didn't want to interrupt your train of thought um, on any questions. We, we've actually just heard as, as of last Friday that the Huntingdinger scheme, the A1 West, was withdrawn. So it's, it's not particularly directly relevant here because it's not in, in our district and it's not an allocated site, but uh, I thought you might want to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Sylvia. Any other questions, please? No? no. Could I just ask a couple, if that's all right? It's just a few things you mentioned, so I didn't know if you could answer them for me. Um, you mentioned, um, or you believed highways were happy, um, and it's based on hard evidence, but do you know if that hard ev evidence included when North Bank is closed due to flooding? I don't know, but... Um I know that there have been there has been a lot over the last two years of uh, liaison between our transport consultants and your highway um, team, uh, including Sarah Han. Um, she obviously um, um, she, you, she 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 won't. She's not going to turn around and, and bend over backwards for anything. She's very strict. Um, and so, actually, it has taken a lot for our transport consultants to um, liaise with her and get it right for her requirements. Now, obviously, she is local and would know that. So, I'm afraid I don't. Sorry. Okay. All right. That's fine. That's, I'll, I'll, I'll stand by your beds over there. So, um, you also mentioned, or you said, um, that the development, the most important area, will not be developed. Who decided what's most important? I'm just trying to get to that, where you got that comment from. Is that, well, I won't, I won't suggest. I'll just, uh, you've said the most important area will not be development. So who decided what's most and least important, I wonder? Uh, right, that is a reference to archaeology. So um, the area between Horsey Hill Fort and the ditch and you'll have seen in the presentation the ditch goes through part of the site and then actually to the south of the cottage is opposite as well so it was obviously a ring ditch around the fort um, so obviously that's very important and if you like the area between the ditch and the fort is its curtilage um, and so that is the most important area um, once you then you've got these rows of posts which were like um I'm trying to say causeway, I don't mean that. Um, boardwalks, I suppose, so that they go out over what would have been the marshes at the time. Um, they, and going over the ditch to reach the outer, oops, sorry, the outer areas. So obviously the outer areas are less um, archeologically important because they're not part of that immediate setting of the fort. Okay, Lily, thank you very much, thank you. Anybody else thank got any you. questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. So, over to you, members. Do you have any questions for officers or legal officer, etc.? Who wants to go first on that? I'm going to go first. Oh, yeah, we got one. I can say, Councillor Hogg, please. So, I have a question for, for, for Nick and Highways. Um, uh, not unsurprisingly, I suppose, uh, considering some of the um, uh, 
uh, testimony or, or um, speeches that we've heard already. Um, and and it, it kind of uh, relates to, to, to this junction, um, which I have to say, I, I do have some concerns with in, in terms of it just being, um, you know, a kind of a T-junction that, um, uh, you know, it, it's quite a large site. There's a lot of industrial units here. Um, you, you just have to count up the number of car spaces. Uh, that means that the, there's going to be a substantial number of car movements into and onto, uh, into and, and, and out of uh, the estate. Um, so, so the question is, I think one of the, the speakers um, mentioned a, a, a mini roundabout, uh, or maybe you know, has that been considered or um, traffic like control uh, to be able to um, more adequately. Um, get people into and off the, the estate. Just seems to me that that road seems to be quite small in comparison to the rest of the, to the side of the estate that we're looking at, certainly. Okay, thank you, Chair, and, and through you. Um, given the scale of the development, um, the sort of access road and that junction layout is deemed to sort of be appropriate. Um, we've act sort of reviewed the, the visibilities in both direction uh, or the geometry and we're sort of satisfied um, at this stage uh, with what the applicants provided. Uh, if I, sorry, I just, mean, to, uh, yeah, just to just add just one more point that, um, um, that the, you know, we've, we've heard um, uh, residents make representations about the, um, the speed of traffic down there. Um, as part of the, the, the recent sort of improvements in that area, um, in, in, for example, the right-hand turn um, and um, the uh, causeway, um, that speed limit in this area has been reduced from 60 to 40 mile an hour, which will obviously have a, an impact as well. Just on that, so th the other thing was that th there was a, a suggestion that um, we would we'd be looking to try and encourage movements from the west rather than from the east. Now, obviously, if that is the case, then there's going to be a lot of vehicles trying to come out of that um, estate and turning right, so crossing the road at that point. So if you, if you have an uneven number of movements to one direction or the other, that means more people crossing the road, presumably. Is that going to be an issue? Um, look at, looking at the, de the design and, and the review that's been through, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be an issue um, in, in this instance. Um, the access um, uh, and, and the sort of trips generated by the development should should there's capacity to sort of co accommodate that with within the junction uh, alignment proposed. Um, uh, yeah, Councillor Jones, please. Sorry, Chair, I can't say a thing at the moment. I just yeah, <laughs> the lights sorry. pouring in there. You did say me, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, talk to me, and then yeah, I'm okay. Sure you say the sun shining. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm just, Mr. Hodgson mentioned, and again, it's developing the point from Councillor Hogg, is if you had traffic only from the west, is that, I, that, that I'm, I'm trying to understand what benefit that would actually bring from a height. Can I have your sort of thoughts, please, Nick, on your consideration of that, what the, uh, the pros and cons might be if this development was to go ahead? Um, I mean, we wouldn't be um, in favour of sort of adding a single, allowing a single, a single di um, direction approach without sort of further modelling. Um, uh, given what we've sort of um, reviewed at the moment, um, it's, it's, we're confident that it can be sort of deliverable um, in terms of what the, the sort of direction that the applicant has proposed. Yeah, carry on. And if I can just go on from there, um, great news, the speed limit's been reduced to 40 miles an hour, but it, it is what sort of evidence is there that... Uh, I mean, you've got two issues, haven't you? You've either got people who aren't going to stick to the speed limit if they can exceed it. Mm. Um, the other one, obviously, is if North Bank is closed, then 
you're not even going to get close to 40 miles an hour, let alone 60. And, they, you know, and again, it's just that sort of um, the ebb and flow that, and, and, and the variation on the speed. I'm just conscious of that being a bottleneck uh, and or a speed trap, depending on the level of traffic. And if you're saying, relax, Dennis, there's no issues here, please tell me. Yeah, I mean, we, we've looked at the, um, the accident data from that area and there's no evidence of any accident clusters. Um, in that stretch of road at all. So there's nothing that really overly concerns us. Um, when it comes to the access itself, we've got, as, as I mentioned before, we've got good visibility. Um, everything is located on a, on a straight. Um, there's good visibility in both directions. And, and yeah, there's, in, in terms of your second point, um, sorry, would you, what's the second point? <laughs> I think I, I think it's just um, if you create, if I'm understanding, there'd be a, a dedicated right turn lane. So there'd be uh, a left and right hand lane, if you like, going past. But I'm just talking about the, uh, and I think everybody's raised it. If it wasn't a roundabout, where obviously you've got, you're not getting people taking any chances of trying to turn right across an otherwise busy road. I think as Mr. Richardson said, you know, we can't get out, you know, um, are you comfortable that people won't try to turn right across oncoming traffic, you know, that there's even with enough visibility and obviously the issues if the North Bank is closed. I'm just, I think like a lot of people, you know, the, the, the two highways, one is highways, the other is archaeology, but this is just my highways hat on, if you yeah, like. Just, just to address that, that North Bank issue, um, I think it was raised by uh, someone before as well. Um, the North Bank, um, it wouldn't be considered normal con um, conditions for the road, so that wasn't factored into the review of um, the, the transport assessment and the data, um, and that's, that's entirely appropriate at the time. Um, appreciate local, local knowledge and there are problems when that is closed. But for what we're looking at here and what our transport, yes, normal conditions is what we're, what we're looking at, including all the background data and trips and generation. Hmm. Yes, who's next? Councillor Hogg. I, I, I just wanted to explore, so the, 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 I think the original um, application had um, access uh, basically using the um, I presume that the, the, the old milk and water drove road that's currently there um, and that was deemed not to be suitable because of the, the problems with that junction. Um, w w was it ever considered to, to maybe have to split the site in two and have maybe one half where it was coming out at, at that junction and then just having the other half um, with the junction that is before us now? Um. Obviously, we're looking at what, what's put in front of us. Um, in terms of the other, the um, addition, that um, western access that, that was proposed at, at a point in the sort of process and engagement we've had with the, with the applicant, um, we have various uh, concerns over an access at that location. Um, but that was obviously just proposed as one access um, for the whole size. Um, and yeah, it would, have, it would have resulted in a sort of objection on our part, given the sort of putting traffic through that um, that junction near, near to proposed bus stop locations, residential dwellings, problems like that. Um, so we were quite pleased when the when the applicant proposed an, a new, well, the eastern access that is currently on the on the um, uh, on screen actually, um, which um, is is you know acceptable in terms of impact. So it's it's um, location and some of the points I've already raised, um, geometry and visibility. Okay, anybody else? These are questions for officers, not just highways. Can we get anything else you want to throw in at this point? At all? Yes, Councillor Iqbal. Thank you, and through you, Chair. <coughs> the applicant um, in their address talk about the transport report. I just want some assurance that do you agree that the transport report is robust, fit for purpose, and does it address all the issues raised by the objectors? Thank you. Um, yes, we've, we've, um, our transport consultants have reviewed this in detail, um, and we're content that all the, all the um, issues have sort of been addressed. And if, 
uh, if it'd be helpful, I can drill down into a little bit more, um, provide a little bit more detail on that. Um, so in terms of the, the traffic surveys, um, the, uh, the initial, um, the transport consultant, the applicant's transport, transport consultant um, used traffic surveys from 2015, 2019, 2021 as part of their initial transport assessment. Um, however, further surveys were undertaken in October 2022 to understand the impact of the, the causeway um, to the east of, um, east of the proposed site. Um, which was obviously created to bypass the level, the level crossing and prevent any build-up. Um, our initial view was that we thought this might uh, increase, you know, uh, traffic, um, given it's more making it a more viable route for, for motorists. But the data received um, indicated that this was not the case at all. Um, should be no, well, the AM and PM uh, traffic peak levels on the A605 actually decreased between 2021 and 2022 according to the data and evidence provided, which has been considered robust. Um, all other um, items, I won't profess to be a, a, a transport modeler at all. Unfortunately, they couldn't be with, us, with me here today, but the um, trip generation, trip distribution, the traffic growth um, has, has been sort of considered robust. Um, the growth considered was up to 2036, which is in line with the current Peterborough local plan. Um, so, yeah, given the scale of the development, um, it is the opinion of our engineers and transport consultants that um, the um, development does not represent a significant impact on the road network. Um, as the road, um, which is actually in this location, the data indicates there's been a reduction in road traffic. Uh, yes, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, Sylvia, I'm not sure you can answer this question. I'm just thinking of meeting with the archaeological officer last week on site. Um, and there are obviously lots of conditions around the archaeology. And I think she used the phrase development-led archaeology. So you find it, and then obviously you look after it. And maybe this is a, a, something that we should be asking Kate, but forgive me. Um, how long so obviously this would be heavily conditioned on what was actually found on the site um there are completely you know, there are concerns that some of it will be quote lost forever and but there are uh, lots of conditions around how it would be accessed is there any time limit on how long that would go on for because i'm hearing that the archaeological officer is basically saying i have concerns over this um but would it actually have any, you know, when does it get to the stage that you keep finding things or they keep finding things? And, you know, when do you get to a stage where it becomes economically unviable? I, don't, I say I don't know whether you can answer that, but this is at the front of my mind when there's obviously these concerns about the archaeology and what could still be on that site. I think the benefit with this site is that there, there has been quite a lot of archaeological work done already. So there was um, trial trenches done in 2008, then there was trial trenching done more recently. So I think the archaeologists feel they know quite a lot about the site already in terms of the, the Bronze Age ditch and rampart and then the, the post alignments that ser service the causeways. So we're not starting with knowing nothing about the site. and. So I think that the, the further work can be quite targeted because it will, will be based upon what's already been found. Um, the conditions do require a written scheme of investigation. So that would be an agreed brief, as it were, agreed between the Council's archaeologist, Historic England, and that would set out very clearly to the developers, archaeologist, what they need to do. So they did be expected to to carry out that work. So that will that will take its course. Um, then there be there, there could be archaeology found. There could be no further archaeology found. You know, of of the eight trenches that were done um, a couple of years ago, there was no archaeology found in two of them, for example. So if 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 there are finds and this further information, and that would then inform what the developer would do to enable building to take place. So we've already 
um, talked about the, the provision of, of, of piled foundations. So, so if, for example, um, a, a discrete narrow line of posts were, were found across the site, then it should be possible to build the foundations of buildings on either side of that, leave them in situ, because they are below ground. The piled foundations wouldn't affect them and the building would, would sit on top. So that, so that that could be achieved. The, the more difficult thing, of, I think, with this site is um, achieving a, a minimum water table. And that, that's what is a bit unusual about it. Um, it's an area that's become sort of more waterlogged since the Bronze Age times. That, that was why it was abandoned, because um, the, the land was getting um, more and more waterlogged. And the, it's important that the, that the posts, for example, are kept in that condition, and that um, the, the risk is that building is allowed to take place over the top and then if the water table is found to, to, to drop as a result of development, then you can't kind of get at it to then record and investigate it further. Um, so, so that's why the conditions are there. And, and the conditions need to work in harmony with each other. So the archaeological investigations, the engineering solution for the, the, the piling foundations, the drainage, and for the landscaping, all need to work together to make sure that the, the water table stays as it is. And from the discussions that Historic England have had with our archaeologists, I think if they feel comfortable that that, that could be achieved, because I think if they didn't feel comfortable, they wouldn't be um, not objecting to the application and agreeing to conditions that they'd be taking a different view. So. So if, if I may, Chair, so in summary, you know, obviously things like this do cause high emotions. Things wouldn't be lost forever if the, 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 the desiccation, either through the piling or through the trees that would lower the water table, you're confident from a, a, an officer point of view that when everything works together holistically, this can be actually, everything can be preserved in situ in the right level of... Um, water. Um, well, well, that's certainly the intention of the conditions, and you know we're, we're still we still have to see what's put forward by the applicant and what their engineering solution would be. Um, but it's it's a, it's a technical matter, so we would we would anticipate that that could be done. Um, I think when when Kate spoke, she mentioned that there'd be a cost of you know um 500,000 pounds for this it's it's not going to be a cheap solution and i, I think the developer is, is well aware of that anybody with any other questions i've got several so i'm surprised i've got a bit more yet but i'm going to start then um uh, okay i did ask this one earlier I, i'll go back to highways as, as you're here sorry nick it's, it's your turn um <laughs> A couple of things that, that came up, obviously, in discussions were uh, one that just confirmed for me, effectively, and I did ask uh, one of the speakers, if the, the, the fact that North Bank floods regularly through the winter nearby and causes a, a massive increase in traffic is not taken into account on your traffic survey? No. It's just not in there? No. It's not and the justification for that is? So it's not considered normal road conditions? Okay, fine, thank you. Uh, right, the other thing I said, uh, or I was concerned about, looking at one of the pictures, and I don't know if Sylvie's got it, um, there was mention of bus stops. And if that, that picture can go up. Um, it's a bit probably clarification because of a concern that I've got by, by seeing this picture, is uh, as, uh, probably not all members will be aware of this, but that particular junction, the south where you see I can't point to it that you're going to you're going to point to you know, that south of those two lorries that are coming out that's milk and water, milk and water drove which has just been improved a few years ago five million pounds investment to it because it was a pinch point a pinch point there's traffic coming from the left that wanted to turn into that road held up all the traffic trying to go to Whittlesey so you can see as it is there there's a filter lane that's just being shown by the the mouse was put in to allow cars to turn right and other cars just to or vehicles to try, go through the Whitwell Sea unhindered. Yeah, is that very clear? Now I'm asking the question, where are these bus stops? Because the whole point of this investment 
was to allow that left-hand lane to free flow all the way to Whittlesey, or certainly, yeah? If I put a bus, if we, or if there is a bus stop in there, we've completely negated the whole point of that five million pound investment. So, uh, I just wanted to, I can see there's obviously a bus stop on the left-hand side, but I understand by reading it, there may be, you can see a bit further along on the right, look, you can see the little blue bus stops. So there's one on each side of the road there. You see them? Where the mouse is, there's one there, and there's one there. Now, if that's a bus stop in there, you know that the car's gonna hang behind, because there's, you know, they can see there's a um, fishbone effect there, and it's just gonna swamp the other junction. So I just wanted to be sure that, is that true, or are you looking to change that? Because that just seems an ex extremely strange thing to approve. So what, what's your thoughts on that? Nick? So yeah, there's, um, there's, there's two bus stops proposed um, as part of this application, um, at this, um, in, in either direction. Um, but we haven't had detailed um, designs of that yet. What we are um, confident is, is that we can get a, a well, put a design forward, um, which is condition, which is detailed under condition 30, that will um, meet all the appropriate sort of standards and, and be in the, an appropriate location where um, any sort of disruption would be minimised. Um, it's worth noting that the, the bus bus service um, in this location would be would be operating on a generally speak, um, what is sort of assumed to be a one bus per hour, um, and that would be operating on a request stop, um, uh, request stop um, operating thing. So the delays associated with this would be um, would be minimal and sort of acceptable. Um, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, for that. Um, if, if, sorry, Chair. If I if yeah, might add. Yeah. Um, Sorry if I didn't ref mention this before, but the location um, of the sort of um, bus stop would be um, subject to change, and obviously a, a suitable late location would be would be part of that process. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. I just want—I spotted that this morning. I just had a uh, concern of that. Okay, um, moving on. Then this is more for you, I'm afraid, Sylvia. Um, right. The one of, one of the um, LP1 uh, thing, it, it says um, the council will work proactively to find solutions to secure development that improves economic, social and environmental conditions in the area. Could you give me examples of how this development will help social and environmental conditions? Please. Well, I think some of the environmental benefits that could arise from the scheme would be um, around the tree and shrub planting. Um, we, we saw that there would be you know, quite extensive additional tree planting to what we saw on site um, that would arise um, around the boundaries of the site and along the, the A605. Um, so that would have nature conservation benefits, both in terms of habitat and in the, the trees and shrubs and he hedgerows themselves. Um, there would be, um, through the sustainability strategy that's been submitted with the application, the, the buildings themselves would, would, would seek to operate to minimise the use of energy, the use of water, um, and incorporate yeah. renewable energy sources such as solar panels and um, electric vehicle charging points. Um, and another environmental benefit would be through the the, the preservation of the archaeological remains in the archaeological preservation area and for that area of land to remain free from development. Um, in terms of, of, of social benefits, the, I think there's probably a bit of an overlap here with the economic benefits from the site. So the, the provision of jobs w within the Peterborough area, you know, and the, for the type of development this is are, are likely to be local jobs and, and therefore that would you know, enable a, an income to be made from, from local people. We see there's a condition that requires the provision of, of, of broadband across the site. And then also the enhanced footway cycleways would encourage further walking and cycling, and that would have health benefits to local people and also potentially to the wider area if there are improvements to the Green Wheel, which is a facility that can be adjoined throughout Peterborough. 
Okay, yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, what else have I got? I have got here. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick, it's you again. Um, the same picture, if we could. Sorry, I should have brought this in at the same time. I do apologise. Um, uh, with the bus stop bit, was there was also a crossing shown on there with a central re uh, refuge area. Yeah, you can make that out, I'm sure. Um, Sylvia will point that out to there. Um, so that's a pedestrian crossing, but not obviously no control. It's just yeah, yeah, with the central refuge. So um, and you're happy that that's, that's a safe crossing point close to Horsey Toll Junction because I've got a feeling that if something comes out of there it's looking left it's not looking right and there might be somebody that crossing there I mean are you far, are you happy that's far enough away we're content given the you know the reduction in speed limits uh, the visibility in both directions um, but as I said before this there's, this will be subject to change I mean we've referenced in our um, uh, response that there were um, if, if you look it seems to be offset from the proposed location of the uh, bus stops yeah. Um, so again, we've gone back to the applicant and you know, appropriate sort of con condition that we'll need to um, work on this um, to make sure that the crossing point is, is situated uh, appropriately to actually pick up pedestrians who want to use the, the, the bus buses in either direction. Um, but we're confident they, uh, that that can be provided in that area given the available road space within the public, public highway uh, and, and the adjacent site. So the chances are that would be moved closer to the bus stops because obviously, as he said in the report, people are just going to walk across the road there. Aren't exactly, they? yeah, that's been picked up in the condition, subject to the appropriate design um, and prior to um, slab level, I believe. Don't quote me on that, um, but it's all detailed in condition 30 in the in the um, in the report. Okay, thank, thanks, Nick. thanks for that. Um, and I have one again here. The field currently is agricultural. I take it. Um, well, I know it's generally crops uh, that are built on that land and, and considering uh, as I said earlier in my earlier question about the environmental benefits and uh, the carbon footprint that we consistently uh, talk about and uh, Peter will be coming uh, you know uh, carbon neutral etc um, should we not be um, encouraging more locally grown crops for our farmers rather than having to push them away because effectively you've pushed, you've pushed a farmer out of his field. He might have sold it, I accept that, but we've lost some agricultural land. I just wonder what your views are on that. Yeah, I mean, the council in its local plan does have a policy to protect the best, most versatile agricultural land, which is classed um, grade one through to grade three A. Now, um, the, the site that we have before us, that um, falls within grade three, but where it's not clear whether it's the part of the best, most versatile agricultural land or it's the category below that um, in, in terms of the mapping that we have available. But what I would say, when you, you look at the, the map of agricultural land quality around the, the sort of urban edge of Peterborough, it's at the lower end and you don't get into the the best most versatile until you go slightly further into the fens and then it is the much higher um, type of agricultural land so so it's around here we have a bit of a mix of moderate to sort of poorer agricultural land in this area um, and I think the council again needs to to make a balancing exercise around the the loss of employment land compared to sorry the loss of agricultural land compared to the the provision of employment uses uh, and also the, the part of the site that would be retained and, and could therefore still be used for agriculture. Uh, I think I'd probably also point out that because of the irregular shape of the site, and we, we saw that when we were on, on site, you know, that does provide some constraints to a farmer. You know, it's a, a limited size of field, it's, a, it's probably a slightly awkward area compared to the, the big open fields that you see most farmers using these days okay fine and the last one which didn't seem to come up at all really or was i know uh, pollution control didn't particularly uh, say anything but with and this may be you nick as well with the obvious increase in traffic counts hiller, uh, hiller, hiller and hog picked up car parking and and journeys and so did the speakers um one would hope obviously in years to come these things will be more 
green, uh, but you know, majority of vehicles on here, cars maybe, but the majority of trucks and lorries are not going to be, not for a long while yet anyway. So are basically uh, the health people and pollution and yourselves happy with the increased pollution that you're going to effectively, all this area is going to create for local residents that live there? I mean, I won't, I won't comment on the on the pollution side, but from the from the traffic data that we've reviewed uh, on in the transport assessment, um, uh, content with the level of uh, we, we consider it robust in terms of the trip generation, the impacts on the network, given the scale of development. Okay, thank you. Uh, have you got anything else to add, Sylvia? Yeah, well, environmental health haven't identified that there's an existing pollution issue. Um, nor, nor have they said that one would would arise as a result of this development. I don't think it's of such a scale that that, that would that would occur. So it's okay. not considered to be an issue. Thank you. And is anybody else going to ask a question? By the way, can I go in? I've got another one, but I, I want to give somebody else a chance. Can't speak. Well. Yes, can't speak. Well. Yes, sorry. I thought you wanted me to go on there. We'll wait for your question. Okay. A bit of clarification. Sylvia. <clears throat> right. So my understanding is that the applicant doesn't fall under the local plan. The applicant has demonstrated that uh, there's a lack of employment space. Based on that, sh we should waive that and uh, grant the application. Now, we have two applications pending before uh, the planning department of the same nature. Doesn't that demonstrate that we have sufficient um, employment space? Okay, are you referring to the two that Councillor Rush mentioned? Yeah, so so of those, um, uh, I think the one that Councillor Rush referred to, Oxney Road, um, is, is either part of the red brick farm allocation, so it's, it's already allocated for, for, for employment development, um, and then the other one, which is the, the former Greyhound Stadium, that is within a, the, the general employment area. So it's part of an existing employment area within Peterborough. Um, now, the, the work that the, the applicants have done um, have looked at both the existing employment area and the, the allocations. And they, they found that the, the, there is a shortage of of remaining employment land. So I don't think we should just take those two applications as, as demonstrating that um, there is sufficient land. Um, the, the council needs to have a variety of, of employment land and plus existing buildings uh, because you will have businesses that will come into the market and leave the market and so on. And existing employment buildings, for example, can become out of date and unsuitable for modern businesses or they can maybe be designed for single occupiers um, that were more prevalent um, in the development corporation days whereas this scheme is for small to medium-sized enterprises that might be small businesses that are just of entering the market they're, they're moving out of their, their their garages and wanting to go into a, um, a slightly bigger set of premises and there just seems to be more demand for that kind of use that there isn't quite so much supply of in Peterborough at the moment. Yeah. Thank you for that. I know from my experience, we always say that all applications are dealt under their own merit. I mean, that's a strong word we use. But isn't there a risk in this application that if we allow it, that we will set a precedence? I mean, this application doesn't fall within the local plan. So am I correct to understand that anybody who wants to uh, apply for uh, employment land and is able to demonstrate that we should entertain that application? Well, I think this is sort of two things. Um, first of all, we would we would treat any um, similar application in the same way that we've treated this one. There would need to be a an evidence base for um, demonstrating a shortage of employment land. You know, things can change over time, uh, and we would then also want to make sure that 
site specific considerations were taken into account. So it's not just a case of there's a, some, you know, that uh, anybody can make the same argument if their site is not suitable, you know, if it's going to have traffic implications, be too close to residential development, you know, affect nature conservation interests. That will all have to be um, proven and demonstrated. There wouldn't be any harm as a result of the development. But I think the second thing also is that we, as of the 1st of April, will be starting the review of the current local plan. So we're at a point where we are looking at, um, at looking at the current situation, looking to the future, uh, and then employment land as well as housing will be key areas that the local plan will tackle, and we will be start again looking at what we currently have uh, and, and making provision for new allocations in the future. So I think that the timing of things is such that any new applications that we come in will start to dovetail with the local plan process anyway. And um, we would expect to see landowners putting forward sites for both employment land as well as residential land as part of the plan process. Yes, Councillor. You've said that the uh, review is going to be undertaken from April, is that correct? And why can't we wait on this application once the review process starts? Because obviously, they are looking at it. That I feel that uh, the planning department are under pressure. Uh, we are being dictated by the applicant giving us evidence rather than redoing our own research and you know making a proper plan, robust. We you know exhaust everything and then we come to a sort of a conclusion. Am I right to feel that? I think that when the application came in back in 2021, we uh, as officers, you know, had a feeling, well, is this the right time or is it not? I mean, two years have elapsed since then. The, the applicants have done you know, repeated employment land surveys to update the information that they they did initially and I think the information they have now is quite is quite robust so we do feel that there is a um, a good evidence base that that shows the employment land is is, is supplies going down rather than than going up um, it it's always it's always difficult when we deal with applications just around the time when we're starting to look at a new local plan and um, what generally will happen is that as soon as the local plan starts, we'll see a lot more applications coming in. It tends to be what, what happens. People um, see, an op well, landowners, developers see an opportunity and will, as well as going through the local plan process, be submitting applications. So I think it's, it's something that we see through every local plan cycle. It, the, the government guidance on prematurity is quite strict and it is quite difficult to refuse applications on the basis of an application being premature to the formation of a local plan review. So I don't think that uh, that's going to be a reason that we would be recommending to the committee to refuse planning applications. We, we, we simply have to assess them on the basis of the current policies that we have and the site specifics and the, and the impacts of that particular development. Okay, can I ask another question now? Um, Councillor Rush brought this up. I made a note and I, I forgot about it actually. Um, bearing in mind the local plan all, as, where all these LPs come from, the actual uh, policies, LP 27 was mentioned by Councillor Rush which relates to landscape character and those of you who know the area, obviously, when you come out of Stangray and you effectively hit Fenland. And there's two things there, really. One is uh, that Fenland objected because they didn't feel, or they felt that this would effectively join Peterborough to Kingsdale. So, so that settlement would no longer be on its own, effectively, uh, with some separation distance. But also, if you look at the detail of LP 27, it does go in about, and it does actually name Peterborough Fens as a special landscape character area. Um, and this area obviously is included in the map. The map that, that accompanies that, it does actually show this area. Um, so the question, I'm, I'm, because effectively, from what I'm hearing, we're being asked to overrule the local plan because of uh, employment land, does this also mean that LP27, we should ignore that 
uh, well, not say ignore it, but um, give it less weight when it's actually our policy, one of our policies. I wonder. No, I would definitely not say that you should ignore LP27. I think it's a it's a very relevant policy, and you know, when looking at development here, the impact on landscape is um, something that would be a material consideration. Um, but just to clarify, the the the, the, the 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 Peterborough landscape character assessment document it covers the whole of the city area. And the map that you referred to divides the whole city area into a number of these character areas. So mm -hmm. it doesn't pick out one as being better than another. It, it's just a description yeah, for, for the, the type six. of landscape character yeah. that, that exists in, in different parts of the city. So, so one's not more special or better than another one. Mm -hmm. They just have different characteristics. Yeah. Okay. And um, yes, this is... Um, so just within the Fenland area, it's, it's a, what I'd call an urban edge site because it's, while it's in the countryside, it, it immediately adjoins the built up area of Peterborough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Any other questions, please? No? Oh, Councillor Hussain. Sorry, there's been much said about the employment allocation sites. So just from officers, just to confirm that under our local plan at the moment, all the possible employment sites have been allocated. So um, we are running out of um, employment sites under the current plan. Yeah, so th this slide shows the strategic employment sites and the, the other employment sites and how much land is allocated under each of those categories. So you, you can see, looking at the strategic employment sites, that we had three of those. Uh, one was at Hampton, 23 hectares. That, that's been developed as Kingston Park, and that's um, out the ground, and um, there will be occupiers in that very soon. The second one, which is the, the biggest application, is Gateway Peterborough, it's at Al Walton Hill, and that has progressed very quickly. Lots of big industrial and logistics sheds up there, and it's, I think there's only one small site left, if that. And then the last one is, is Red Brick Farm, which it, um, has got outline permission. That was granted um, uh, last year or the year before. Reserve Matters will be coming in soon. It's being actively developed as a joint venture between the church commissioners and Treeboard Developments, who are a big industrial and logistics developer. Um, they work across the, the, the whole country, um, and so they're actively promoting that site. So the so what, so what you can see there is of, of this large um, amount of employment, a lot of it has been developed already, and it's really just the red brick farm site that is left. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, on, of those sites, um, from my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, most of those sites are the large warehouses, um, sort of distribution centers, rather than the small uh, SME sort of idea of sort of businesses etc to go into there so I don't think any of those sites have that is that right yeah that, that's right um, they, they, they they weren't allocated specifically for um, big sheds as it were um, but that has been in the recent year what the market has has shown an interest in um, and a requirement for, for briding. So yes, they, they, these ones have all gone for these large single occupier um, um, units and they don't currently provide for this sort of development. And, and that's really the point that the applicant is making, that uh, we've got a lot of, of, of big units, but we haven't got a lot of smaller units. Anybody else? No. Okay, so we've done that. Thank you very much, officers, for your, for your time with that. So we're going to move straight into debate. So who would like to kick that off? Councillor Hogg. Welcome to the breach, dear friends. 
Um, so, <clears throat> I, I like a lot of these um, applications that come forward, um, that come to committee, um, I always find myself, um, or generally speaking, I do find myself torn um, to a degree. Um, they're never fairly clear-cut cases of, of yay or nay. Um, I find that, that, that with this site, I mean, it clearly that, you know, it has, has been highlighted, the, 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 you know, that this type of um, uh, buildings that, um, that for SME use um, is, is something that is, is in um, short supply. Um, although I note that there are, um, you know, a number of, uh, of these applications coming forward as one at um, Litchwood, I believe, that's coming forward, um, which was a, a, a development for an old uh, car park for um, the Litchwood um, office building. Um, and a, a number of big sheds have been, um, sort of old big sheds have been subdivided into smaller, um, because generally speaking, the big shed um, operators like to have something that's brand new um, and fit for purpose, and, and not something that was maybe you know 20 years old or what have you. So um, that tends to be the trend. Um, so on the one hand, I, I do take on board these, you know, that, that, that it is in short supply. But I think that there are uh, other operators coming forward with with solutions to this problem. Um, uh, this site is 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 tricky. There's no there's no two ways about it. Um, I'm I'm really quite not easy with 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 the um, the ingress and egress up from the site in terms of the um, that road coming in on on, on the eastern side of, of the uh, and I can understand why that you know the initial um, access road on the on on the eastern side was was um, changed um, but I, I I do find that that, that I do think that, that there, there are going to be issues with, with a site this big. Um, and I also have uh, issues around the, the, you know, the heritage side of things in terms of um, the, the loss of the, the causeway um, uh, opportunities um, in terms of um, being able to kind of maybe get some other bits and pieces out the ground. Um, for, from my point of view, I, I would rather see this come back um, in a kind of a two-phase approach, that, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the eastern side um, seems less problematic than the western side of this site. Um, kind of, I think on the on the map, it's um, development area three and four. Um, I haven't got a particular problem with, um, and, and I think that you know, if you, if that approach was taken, then um, then a, the access road wouldn't be so 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 bad because it. Of clearly, um, probably less than half of the of the vehicle movements, uh, and lessons could be learned from from that. Um, so at the moment, I am kind of teetering on the on on the point of saying, actually, uh, I feel there's still some more work to be done, I, and I I realise and I, I do take on board that there has been a lot of work done on this, and a, a lot of change has come forward through you know as you look through the through the notes. So um, I, I am. I, I'm going to be interested to see what other members of the uh, of the committee have to say. Um, I've not quite made my mind up. Um, as I said, I am kind of teetering a little bit, um, so I can be persuaded to, to cross the fence, as it were. But at the moment, I am um, minded to to to, to um, reject. Councillor Hiller, please. Um, yes, th thank you, Chair, and. Um, I uh, listened very closely to what uh, Councillor Hogg had to say, um, and Councillor Iqbal, I think, made some very relevant points about the precedent, the potential precedent set. If we um, allow this development to go ahead, and um, uh, Mrs. Bland quite rightly um, said that any new application would be site-specific, of course it would be, um, and it would take into consideration traffic considerations for the highway access and, and proximity to residential development. Well, frankly, you couldn't get much closer to a re residential development than this particular site. So if that's what we're taking into consideration, then it doesn't bode well potentially for 
future development coming forward. Um, revision of the local plan, I think Cabinet made a very wise decision that uh, the local plan should be revised. Um, I get and I fully appreciate having had experience that local plan revision rewriting does take time but my feeling with this particular site is that it should be put forward as part of a local plan revision and considered duly. Um, let's not forget that there were hundreds of objections to this and it's all very well saying, I have to suggest and I don't mean to be rude but somewhat glibly that we've covered all the objections from, from these residents. Well, have we? What about the light pollution? What about the noise? What about, how on earth are you going to condition reversing beeping lorries uh, when they're coming from disparate companies potentially um, to that particular site? How, how does that work? How, do, how does one condition that? And frankly, I wouldn't want to have that uh, light and noise pollution inflicted upon me if I lived in one of those properties on the new development there. The precedent worries me, I have to say, is if, if Acme builders came along and said, OK, um, you, you, you said, Mrs Bland, um, they would have to produce a report to justify it. Well, the report exists. It's the commercial report that is uh, created by Edison's and paid for by Barnack Estates, the applicant. Mm, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Um, so I feel that we do have employment land that's available. It's currently going through um, substantial employment land, so, so substantial areas, thousands, tens of thousands of square metres. Um, does this necessitate this particular site, this awkward site? And I take fully what Councillor Hogg was saying about the, the potential for issues with that particular road. I know that road well, um, having travelled on it many, many times, and it is a difficult road. Um, the uh, objectors quite eloquently talked about the traffic issues on that road, especially, and um, uh, Councillor um, um, Harper mentioned about the traffic report not taking into account when the road from Thorny to Whittlesea is closed, which it is frequently. I sit on the internal drainage board that looks after that particular area and I know just how often that floods and, and the traffic is absolutely appalling along that road. Um, this would just exacerbate that um, and we haven't taken that into account. So I think at this juncture, Chair, I, I would not be supporting this application. I think it should be considered as part of the round of site allocations when the local plan is revised. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jones, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, I made some notes before as we were going along and listening to Councillor Hogg and Councillor Hiller and indeed Councillor Iqbal. I get the development, I completely get it. The two words that's coming to my mind is touch and feel. In terms of touch, um, yeah, we need an SME pipeline. There's absolutely no issues with that. But in practice, the, how I feel that there are, there are two major um, setbacks for me. One is the archaeology and the other is the highways. And obviously Barnack Estates has done an awful lot of work on this and uh, they're, they're, they're willing, it appears, to pay an awful lot more to protect the archaeology. Um, but given the time it's taken, the potential for the review of the, the, the local plan, I think has already been said by um, my planning colleagues, is, is it not worth hanging fire until it's taken into consideration? I can see the reason for the approval, but something just isn't sitting comfortably, and I think it's probably been expressed with the number of, of things that um, I'm not absolutely convinced about that road i don't travel it to any great degree but um there's something about it that just doesn't stack off so intuitively i'm not in favor although i do appreciate that barnack estates have put an awful lot of effort and hard work into it but there's something around this that at the moment i don't think this is the time and the place to go forward with this particular development thank you Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Hussain. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I was making loads of notes as well. I mean, there's so many different things to look at. Um, as for the road, I, I've travelled on that road many a time as well. And uh, when when the other you know road's been closed, um, I think the road from Cardia, which goes to Amazon or the bypass, has, has reduced a lot of traffic now. Um, whenever I've travelled on it. Um, archaeology was initially a, a thing for me, but like Councillor Jones has said, I think Barnock have done a, a good job in 
addressing that for me. Um, you know, it's protected. They've gone a, a long way to to make sure that um, the the things there are, are, are not harmed um, in any way. So for me, that that was a good thing. Having come from a small business background myself, I can see and I know um, that there is a real demand for small um, SME units uh, in and around Peterborough. Um, I myself get asked all the time if there's anything available by people that are looking to set up. Um, so that there is a real need for that and that seems to be the only thing holding small enterprise back in our city and if we want it to develop then I think we do need sites like this. Um, so traffic wasn't really a concern for me because of the bypass um, and because of the changes that we made at the crossing. Um, and I really think that we do need more sites like this to, to help business uh, develop in Peterborough and for people to prosper. So I'm for this application. And also looking at, I think, what they've done with the junction, I would say there's a similar site, and I think it was by the same developer in, in, in um, Yaxley, where there is only one junction coming out on a similar site. Uh, and it seems to suffice and it's very close to a bend or actually closer to a bend than this is um, Again, I've got people that I, I work with there on a regular basis. So travel there never had an issue coming in and out of that junction um, So I will be voting in favor okay. Anybody else? Councillor Warren <coughs> I think like everyone else, I've been making lots of notes and I had lots of concerns over this application. I think my first concern was about the local plan and how this fits and how can I prove this plan with the local plan. And I think we've demonstrated that we have a severe deficit of the uh, employment area and this is why we need to improve the plan. Even though it is not in the local plan, we still need to improve it under this condition of needing more employment land for SMAs. I had a real concern about archaeological surveys and how this site is going to be affected, how the building is going to affect this causeway that's there and how it's going to affect the ditch. With the conditions that this application is going to put forward, I'm um, sufficiently that has now de demonstrated that the archaeological of this site will be able to, in the best interest of the developers, are going to mitigate against that. Again, the landscape and neighbourhood amenities. I was looking at how this site is going to affect the residents of Stanground and how they're going to make sure that they I've dealt with issues with street lighting and noise, and I know sometimes with my conditions, they have put conditions in place, and with environmental health, they've been able to say that they don't have reversing lights, don't have that street lighting, and I've been able to sort out my neighbourhood's complaints. So knowing from what the conditions that they've put in, with they've got this plan, that these the concerns are now gone. And I didn't really have much concerns with the highways. I know that the 0605 has been approved much more since you know, I've driven that ride quite previously, but I find that road has improved much way, so I have no concerns over highways. On balance, I know this is going to create some harm, but I think the benefits outweigh the harm. And very, very tightly, I would say I'll go with the officer's recommendation and approve the plan just very slightly. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Anybody else going to...? Yes, Councillor Iqbal. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, I will try to avoid uh, repeating things that my fellow colleagues have already said. Um, as I said in my questioning, that my real concern still remains that uh, we are going to uh, be setting a president which I would like to avoid at every cost. Um, and I have to praise Councillor Rush. Where are you? Um, his presentation was um, excellent. Um, I think he addressed um, all the concerns uh, in a very relevant and perfect manner. Um, he raised them properly, and I don't believe that, uh, from my point of view, that uh, the officers or the applicant addressed his concerns. I don't know how long it took you to prepare this uh, statement, but it was, it was good. So I always take give weight um, to, to to the local councillors' concerns, obviously. They are the first port of call. If there's any issues in the ward, um, surely this application also has objections, which I also give a lot of weight to. Um, on balance, I believe that uh, the applicant and the officers have not uh, done enough to convince me uh, to go in their favor. Uh, on that basis, I am minded to go against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Iqbal. Councillor Sharp, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and there's, there's obviously, as we've, we've debated, and as everybody said, taking a lot, we've all taken lots of notes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of threads to this one. As everyone try and break some, something that's very complicated down into very simple, uh, simple blocks. For me, it's, it's about the significant and demonstrably adverse impacts. Are they greater than, and outweighing the benefits? So very simply, the benefits, economic and growth. I don't, I'm not hearing in the debate that there's any doubt about the economic, e economic benefits, the growth benefits from, from this proposal and the need for SME land. If I move on to the adverse impacts, my, fir my first major concern, I think, was, was impact to neighbours and amenity. Um, there were a number of, a number of comments, or, or you might call objections. Um, I think a lot of those have been addressed because a lot of them were relating to the actual construction as opposed to the ongoing presence of, of the operation. That was certainly my initial concern. Traffic, traffic loading being the second one. As it stands, and we've had a lot of debate, and I asked some questions of the applicants, as you heard, and of the objectors. I'm hearing nothing at the moment that disproves the highway's view that we can create a safe and manageable access egress to the site. I mean, uh, Councillor Harper raised some questions about bus stops and so on that hopefully will be picked up. I think the frequency, perhaps, of the bus stops will, bus stopping will be so limited that um, there's a question about how much impact that would, that would bring. But all, I, th I think what I was summarising that piece is that I'm hearing nothing that from from highways officers to demonstrate that they wouldn't be able to pick up and control all those issues. So that leads me on to the final concern in, in adverse impacts, which is really around archaeology. Um, the applicant has certainly taken on board some, some of the concerns that have been raised, and as we, and we heard, prepared to invest a significant amount of extra money um, to offset some of those, uh, those concerns. I do question as well that if we defer this to the local plan and this land becomes adopted in a local plan for small development, is there a danger of actually we lose some of that potential investment and, and some of those benefits by that process? That's perhaps not for debate today because I don't know the details, but it's perhaps a concern of mine. And then finally, the applicant does seem to have taken considerable measures to, to address the impact on the, on, the, on the local monument with the screening, um, deferring land to, to, to green space and, and screening as opposed to using it, for, using it for extra income, if you like, an extra sale. So on, on balance, I think a considerable amount of input has been, has been placed by the applicant. I'm still, I still hear a lot, of, a lot of the concerns. I still a wavering on the archaeology piece, a personal interest in maintaining local archaeology and national archaeology. However, we have dem I do feel we have demonstrated a need. So I am borderline on this. I have to say I am borderline, but just at the moment, I'm wavering slightly in, in favour of supporting the officer's decision simply because I'm not hearing enough evidence to, to turn it the other way and to overturn it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sharp. Councillor Joan. Yeah, um, I'm listening to everybody, and, and the one thing is, and going off uh, Councillor Rush's presentation, I'm always mindful, it, first of all, I don't live anywhere near here, so it doesn't affect me directly, but e equally, I'm always looking out for the, the, the NIMBYs, and, and, and I haven't heard that in this particular instance, and there are still the known unknowns. And I think what it's done, it's clarified my thoughts that and again, um, highways can only go off normal conditions, and I agree with Councillor Sharp. Under normal conditions, then I think that highways have got all the bases covered. Um, last winter, um, we've had a, a lot of abnormal conditions, and I remember the, uh, the North Bank was shut extremely frequently. And once we set this in motion and it's done, not so much from the archaeology, I'm, I'm, I'm actually reasonably comfortable about that. And I, was, um, I didn't find from the archaeological officer that they were terribly, 
that they were particularly anti. That didn't come across from me at all. But I think there's, there's, there's a number of things together and they're more the human factors and it's just helping me to clarify my thoughts that whilst I'm ever so close to seeing the need, at this stage I'm thinking there's absolutely no need to rush our fences despite the excellent report I'm sure that Barnack Estates and Edison's have put together that I'm still just on balance um, suggesting that we hang fire and minded to go against officer recommendations on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Anybody else wish to carry on with the debate? No. You said what you want to say? Yeah. Well, I'll just enter into the debate now as, as I've asked quite a few questions and I'm sure you'll want to hear uh, what I'm thinking. Um, the big question, should we override the local plan, which is effectively what we've been asked to do? You know, that local plan took hours and hours and hours and years to put together, um, many hours. It went to consultation. Um, councillor will probably put me right at least two to three times. It came to council at least two times, went through full debate and was agreed by council, that local plan. So it, it went through the proper motions. And yes, uh, quite rightly, uh, we're seeking, we've seen those issues and we're seeking to revise that. But if we go against the local plan, of course we set precedence. Nobody can argue that because you've, you've gone against your local plan. But quite rightly, Sil is quite right that everything, every development, and you all know that, is, is decided and determined on its own merits. But one of the things you can't do is say it goes against the local plan. Because you've already said you don't, you're going to override the local plan. So if a similar development come along, you couldn't really use that argument. So it's something to bear in mind. Everything else could still be, of course. Should we continue to build on greenbelt areas, agricultural land? I don't think we should. Um, Archaeologically, this is an extremely important part of Peterborough. This is Peterborough's history here. We only see a little bit. Those of you who have been there will see there's a bit of a fort there. You'll see the banks. What you can't see is what's under the ground. You'll see some of the picture. You can see some of the outline of the fort, but you can't really see what's under the ground. But you couldn't see what was under the ground at Flag Fen, and you couldn't see what was under the ground at Must Farm either. But look how important they are to our city and our surrounding area. So do we concrete over it effectively? Sylvia mentioned something on the visit, which is quite true that effectively it preserves it down there. But does, as has been mentioned, 500 plus piles going down there. Preserve? Will it guarantee it? I'm not sure it would. Fenland, then I brought this up before. Um, they don't like the idea of um, their settlement at King's Delft being effectively swallowed into the Peterborough area, even though there's a boundary. It would adjoin. They like that separation distance and they've, they have written in and they've said that. And speaking to people in that area, they, they feel exactly the same. So it's not, it's not uh, just anecdotal. There are jobs, quite has been mentioned, 400 odd jobs on construction. Some big money there, no doubt about that. Highways wise, I brought up uh, my concerns and, and, and while I'm not surprised, um, I guess I'm disappointed that a, a known pinch point that has been going on for many, many years, and Councillor Hill has brought it up, and others of you have driven that way know uh, from Councillor Hill's um, experience on the drainage boards, that that road is a nightmare and always has been. Whenever there's a flood at North Bank, it happened a week ago, just a week ago, we had loads of traffic down there. When we're told we can't take that into account. It's, it's, it's difficult, uh, but you know, I, I accept that, but I find it very difficult that we just gloss over what is a major problem and add to it, put more traffic on it. Especially when we just spent five million on improving it. Uh, the last thing I guess I'll bring in really, uh, from my point of view, is LP27. I, I, I did, uh, Councillor Rush uh, mentioned it, I've touched on it, I've read through it a bit at a deeper level because I brought my policy book with me 
uh, and I went through that, and, and I'll mention it again. It does say there are six landscape character areas, quite rightly. Uh, Sylvia told us that. One of them is the Peterborough Fen. And there's quite a few things, we, things there that it tells us we should take into account when we make decisions. Uh, and I, I'd ask you to, at some point to read that because these, these are important things. But one of the main ones is it's, you should protect the landscape settings and separate our identities of settlements. Well, that's King's Delft gone. So we can't separate the identity because it becomes part of the Peterborough area effectively, or touches on. Uh, and there's no, and I'd say protect, protect landscape settings. We all know pro, uh, Fenland is primarily flat. As you go out there, you can see for miles. On a clear day, you can see for miles. Well, you, you won't be able to see for miles across that site. You'd have lost that. So again, under LP27, you've not protected the landscape settings and you've not uh, separated the identities of settlements. There's so many bits in there that you, I can only suggest you, you read through. Safeguard and enhance important views and vistas. Included skylines in and out of the development layout. So it was mentioned again by an objector. It's very dark there at night. It's nice. So we're going to lose that or potentially lose that with lighting, no matter what, what, what uh, type of lighting goes on there. So we're not safeguarding, we're not enhancing any important views that way either. I suppose the only important view, as has been mentioned, is the cathedral, where they could have put a gap in between, so if you're at a certain point, you could see very limited cathedral view. But I don't think that really carries any weight, to be honest. Uh, so, yeah, um, it's a really difficult one, and I understand and I appreciate all the debate that's gone on in here. You know, at the end of the day, it's not a straightforward, easy decision. But having said that, if we, in my view, agree to this, we effectively throw our local plan into the bin. And where I would rather see that as we've started the review, we wait for that review, as has been mentioned, and if this land is suitable, and officers and experts and over the next couple of years or so and indeed the public who will be consulted and councillors will be consulted and we'll debate it in council if we all decide that's a good bit of land then most of that's gone isn't it so it comes here it would come here if this particular land and say this bit of land is allocated and how many times have we sat in here and people said to us it's not allocated land and we've used that red line um, and village envelopes and things like that. So for me, it's important it's, you know, to step outside. You've got to be very careful. Uh, I'm not prepared to step outside that red line in this case. Uh, I think it, it should go to in the next review, and then we'll see what everybody agrees at that point. So uh, with that in mind, I would be not supporting the officers' review with all this here. Anybody else? Could we see a uh, anybody willing to go for a, for a proposal yet? Oh, would you like to come back? Of course, that's quite fine. Yeah, it's quite fine. Okay, um, I mentioned previously that it, it's often very difficult to refuse a planning application on the basis of, of, of precedent. And I just think it would be helpful, given what we've heard in debate, just to reiterate to you paragraphs 49 and paragraphs 50 of the NPPF. And it says that arguments that an application is premature are unlikely to justify a refusal of planning permission other than in the limited circumstances where both A, the development proposed is so substantial that to grant permission would undermine the plan making process by predetermining decisions about scale, location or phasing of new development that are central to an emerging plan and the emerging plan is at an advanced stage, but is not yet formally part of the development plan for the area. And then paragraph 50 goes on to say, refusal of planning permission on grounds of prematurity will seldom be justified where a draft plan has yet to be submitted for examination before the end of the local planning authority publicity period on the draft plan. Where planning permission is refused on the grounds of prematurity, the local planning authority will need to indicate clearly 
how granting planning permission for the development concerned would prejudice the outcome of the plan making process. So, so I think that's quite clear national guidance that I would suggest that the committee do take into account before formulating reasons for refusal. Very important. Thank you very much, Toby. Uh, Councillor Hussain, yeah, I'll come to you. So I just wanted to add, so um, a few colleagues have obviously mentioned the local plan um, and well, to go against you know, the local plan. At the moment, obviously, it's been, um, d I believe, demonstrated by officers that the current local plan that we have, have obviously asked a review on or are looking to update um, is out of sorts and it does need updating. So there is a need um, for, for this kind of development. Um, so in, in that sense, in, in one way, we're saying that, look, the local plan's not good enough. We definitely need a new local plan, but at the same time, we, we don't want to go against the current local plan, even though it's not good enough. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councillor Jones. Yeah, um, thank you, Sylvia. I get it, and I'd say I get the development entirely. There is no question of that. I think for me, you know, when whether it goes to appeal, whether it becomes formulated within the local plan, I'm looking to the people with long trousers and grey beards who know an awful lot more than me who will actually pronounce on something like that. But, you know, I just have to go back to my limited knowledge, what I'm expected to do here. And, and, and again, it really is just on balance uh, that, that I, we do need it. Nobody's denying it. But right here, right now, it just doesn't feel right to me. And that's why my decision is, is as I've already stated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hiller. You want to come in? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. But just picking up on this um, local plan, um, uh, the revision of the local plan is issue that we, we seem to be bouncing around a little bit uh, football-like. Um, I don't think the suggestion ever was that this is subject to a local plan revision, whether it gets accepted or not, whether it's put forward or not, delayed by the local plan. All, all I'm saying about the revision to the local plan is that this could be included as a site for consideration um, in the local plan revision, not that it would be, because I think it's wrong. As, as the chair has outlined very succinctly, I think it's wrong to, to deviate from the current local plan. And let's not forget that the local plan, you know, as soon as it's adopted, it's out of date. I mean, we all know that. Um, the, to suggest that the, the numbers for employment sites um, are in the current local plan have to, have to stretch until 2036, it, of course, is, is, is nonsense. <laughs> That's why we're revising local plan now we're embarking upon a, a revision. Um, a lot has been said about Barnack Estates and how much money they've spent on this application. I completely get that. Um, and I would also just say, it, it, to, to, with that in mind, you know, Barnack Estates, they're not a frontline emergency service. I mean, they, 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 they're here to make money. They, they, they are a profit-making commercial enterprise. So if it's agricultural land, one has to assume it's considerably cheaper than buying uh, you know, a brownfield site in, in, the middle of, uh, in the middle of the city. So let's, you know, this is what they're here to do, is, is to uh, create the opportunity to build SME facilities so that they can on sell or rent them or whatever they do um, and make money Let, let's not forget that um, I haven't um, so my inclination is still to say no no to this and I think for all the right reasons that are very capably outlined in LP4 and, and as the chair has quite rightly alluded to LP27 heritage heritage considerations notwithstanding thank you chair Thank you, Councillor Hiller. Anybody else? No. No, well, I think we've done the debate then. So, um, proposal. Do you have a proposal at this point? Or do you wish to carry on with the debate? Okay, and if we've finished debate, I'm going to go to the proposal then. Uh, Councillor Hiller, please. 
thank you, Chair. I, I will make a proposal. It, it's not universally going to be accepted. I completely get that. But uh, from what I've listened to, what, what the justification for this development, I, I don't think has been made, frankly. And so I would s s recommend, my suggestion would be, that we go against the officer's recommendation on, on this um, application, uh, citing the local plan policies that I have already, which primarily is, is LP4 and, and LP27 and the considerations therein. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Do, do you need any further clarity for that? We just need to clarify that a little bit more, really. Please, if you just hold on a second. Yes, Councillor Killer, could you just elaborate a little bit on the Hiller? <laughs> um, yes, the, the your reasons for refusal. Um, the, the, the policies are the part of your justification, but what is the actual reason for refusal? The reason for refusal is I don't think the case has been proven for um, a dearth of employment site. Okay, and that's in relation to policy uh, LP4, which is a spatial strategy for employment, and it sets out the amount of employment lands to be provided. Okay, where do you see um, sections A, B, and C? Uh, on page nine of your report, LPO4, strategic strategy for the location of employment skills and university development, LP4, A, B, C, and D, although I don't think D is that relevant. Does that make sense? Okay, just bear with me, I'll get there. You could just leave it at LP4 if you like. It doesn't have I, think, I think it's just worthwhile getting clarity, because obviously, yeah. if you want in a second, perhaps we need to make sure that they are quite clear on what you, what you want to refuse okay. on. So your reason is that as of insufficient cases been submitted, which does not justify that there is insufficient employment land that would warrant a deviation from the local plan. Deviation from the local yes. plan. Now, just because an application deviates from the local plan isn't necessarily a reason for refusal. There needs to be some harm that arises from it. So you will be able to describe that harm. Okay, well I would suggest that LP4 does that quite adequately. Um, promoting the development of Peterborough economy, employment development will be focused in the city centre. This isn't. Um, elsewhere in the urban area, it's not and in urban extensions, it's not. Provision will be made for six, uh, 76 hectares of employment from April 15 to 2036, we've covered that already. Mixed use developments will be encouraged particularly in the city, um, district and, and local centers. This isn't, it's on the outskirts and it's in ar ar arable land, but outside the, uh, the built development area. Um, of stand ground employment proposals not within central employment areas or business parks will be supported provided there is no suitable sites within allocated sites and built up areas and I think we've, we've got sites already coming forward in those areas um, that provide for in excess of 30,000 square meters of employment use um, and existing allocated site not, uh, not result in any unacceptable impact. Well, I think LP27, and I think from what the chair has uh, said about the, uh, the unacceptable impact um, would, would be prevailing there. 
um, and the expansion of existing businesses located outside of allocated sites will be supported providing existing buildings are reused where possible, there would be no unacceptable amenity, highway or character impacts. And I think we've covered pretty much all of that in the debate that we've had. Um, Mrs. Bland, if that satisfies what you're... So I think from, from what I heard, I think perhaps the harm is more associated with your second reason for refusal relating to LP 27. That certainly there. Is, is significant, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, because that, that's the policy that relates to, to landscape character. Um, and it says planning permission be granted if the proposal would, and it lists a number of, of criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, it requires enhancement of the, the character and special qualities of the, the local landscape. Uh, and from what you said earlier, you, f you feel that the, this development wouldn't achieve that? I don't think it would, no. Okay. Um, and there are other points there. Reflect and enhance local distinctiveness and diversity. Nope. Okay, and then it also talks about identifying, maintaining, and where possible, enhancing natural or man-made features of significant landscape, historical, cultural, wildlife, and geological importance. Indeed. Are, are there any of those in particular that... Well, the heritage, you, yes. I think so the heritage <laughs> aspect of the heritage, it is, is yeah. particularly important. Okay, is that the archaeology or the scheduled monument? The archaeology. I don't think the scheduled monument is particularly it's impactful. The, 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 the setting of the scheduled monument was one of the issues that Historic England had well, recognised that there would be less than substantial harm. Okay, that's why okay. I haven't included it. Okay. Okay. okay, and sorry, there was no, just a right. um, couple I'm of other sure things. Uh, important views and vistas. Uh, I don't know if there are particular views and vistas here. Um, well, I, th I think it's probably, as you come down the, the, the main drag from uh, Stanground, you cross the bridge, and then you, one is, is then, instead of the countryside, and there, and I think the chair has alluded to it on a couple of occasions, you, you'll have this development this, this um, employment development um, in, instead of arable land and the view of that arable land. I think that's quite, quite a consideration. Okay, so views from um, the built up here in Peterborough towards the country, open countryside. Yes. Okay, and then point E relates to protecting landscape settings and separate identities of settlements. No, not really. I think the impact I would have a cons I, I have an issue with the impact on the residential development in Stanground that abuts pretty much abuts that. And I appreciate there's a um, a green area between the backs of those houses and their gardens and the proposal. But my concern there would be, uh, as I've already outlined, is that that light pollution, noise potential light pollution, potential noise pollution. Um, will impact upon those residential properties. And I would suggest that's where the, the majority of those hundreds of objections have come from, is, is, is probably that residential area. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, I think that's probably a, a, another issue. But uh, the chairman mentioned the, his concern about the coalescence with the Whittlesea and extension of the built-up area, right. is that forming part of your reason for refusal? No, no, no. it isn't. No. no, okay. No, I don't think that impacts on this. Right, okay then, so, I'd, um, so, so we have the, the initial reason for refusal relating to development that's not allocated in development plan and that the case hasn't been sufficiently proven to, to, to justify why 
land in the countryside should be released for development and that it would have landscape impacts, which we've just gone through, contrary to policy LP27. Mm. And uh, the first part of your pro pro uh, proposal was contrary to policy LP4. All right. Okay. Okay, I think that's reasonably clear. Thank you. I think it was worthwhile going through that, though, because obviously, you know, you can't just say against, effectively, at that without knowing what it's all about. So, based on, uh, Councillor has put a proposal for, based on that, does anybody want to second him? Councillor Iqbal, you're seconding, yes? Yes, sure, I'm happy to second it. So, therefore, committee, we have a um, proposal uh, and a seconder, so that is a valid um, proposal, so we'll go to the vote. So, all those in favour? Seven. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're going to have to do it again because obviously, Councillor B, you can't be included in the vote because you left the room during the actual presentation. I do apologise, but that's the way it is. Uh, so we'll go again. Can we go for four, please? Are you four or, or what, Councillor Bond? It's all right. Because your hand kept going down, sir. And we've got six now. Reason six, right, and against that uh, proposal. And abstaining on that proposal. Six, um, yes, okay, so that's six, four, two against, uh, one abstention, so in that case the proposal is agreed and the application is refused. Thank you very much. Yes, I think because uh, we've got to go to the, the next part uh, will be um, the report. I think we need a little comfort break. That's uh, quite a long session. So, uh, I don't know. Quarter two. Thank you. About quarter two. Well, you just have to leave, wouldn't you? There's no decision on it. It's only an informative, it's not a decision.
Okay. Um, all right, guys, we're, we're going to... Thanks, thanks very much for that. Thanks, thanks for getting back. back. We're, we're going, going on to item five, five which is the quarterly appeals report. And again, we'll be for Sylvia to introduce. Okay, th thank you. You'll, you'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to keep you very long with the appeals report. Um, it's, it's much as, as normal. Uh, we had nine appeals. Of those, five were allowed, which was a little bit higher than we normally would, but that's because we refused three advert-related appeals in the city centre where we thought that um, big 75-inch LCD screens would have an impact on the conservation area. Um, it was probably one of these appeals where you know, it's 50-50 as whether the council would win it or not, but we felt that given the nature of these types of developments that, that we should do, the inspector decided to allow it. Um, and I have to say, it's not that we're just blanketly against adverts in the city centre. We received quite a few of them at the same time, and we approved um, most of them. Some we refused that were that, that didn't go to appeal, but uh, that there are others that you'll see up in the city centre, part of modern day life, uh, whether you agree with it or not. Uh, the only thing that I would point out in terms of lessons learned is the appeal at 17 Crowland Road. And I bring that to your attention because you remember the application that, that came to committee. We went out on a site visit. It was for a car window tinting business in a backland development. A lot of animosity between the applicant and the neighbour. As he spoke at committee, we put stringent conditions on to minimise the impacts of that development. The applicant appealed against one of those conditions and um, that was the decision that I've attached to this report. And in that case, the inspector did agree with us that the condition was required, it was justified, and he has dismissed the appeal, therefore the condition stays. So I think that's a, a very good result. Yeah. So um, that is about it, really. We had a, an appeals telecom prior approval appeal. Uh, we we're getting a lot of telecoms applications in at the moment. They're always controversial. This one, we, we didn't win. It was allowed. We were concerned about impacts of trees against, uh, within a shelter belt that the mass would be seen against but the inspector placed more weight on the need to rule out modern telecoms communications than um, the, the relatively minor impact on trees within a shelter belt, so i.e. there was not a single tree, but a, you know, a whole area of trees, therefore the, the impact would have been minimal in his view. So unless there's any particular questions that you have on any of the appeals, then that's it. There's an appeal in my ward, um, which has, seems to have gone on for months and months and months and months without a decision, and that's the agricultural tie um, in West End Road in Maxley. Um, and I think that was middle of the year, last year, that, that appeal was made, um, lodged, and we still haven't had, or I haven't seen a decision yet. Any particular reason for that? No, the, the planning inspectorate do take quite a while. They, they tend to release their appeal decisions in batches as well. Uh, and we've, they're not reported in this report, it'll be next time, but we have had a little flurry of them, so it may well come in in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Councillor Sharp. Thank you. Yeah, it was just in relation to the, to the, the 5G appeal at the return, because if I'm if I'm right in saying, I believe there's another one that's now gone to appeal, so are we likely to lose more? Or have we got a number that's not heading to appeal because we've turned them all down? I just wonder what are we got an increased run rate coming that's going to drop off? So. Um, not necessarily. I think it depends on the, the reason for the refusal, but you, know, you are correct in that the government is weighted towards allowing these rather than refusing them, so we we do have a harder job and they so they set a higher threshold for for um dismissing them yeah. okay um yes, yes, council, yes sorry 
there was the uh, I seem to remember there was the appeal for the, the one on Arundel Road, the kind of outbuilding the, with, the, with the high roof. Um, the, has that has that gone through yet, or is that still due? Um, that one's not springing to mind. I mean, we, we we're reporting the appeal decisions between October and December in this report. So. March appeal decision, yeah, so in which case we report it the next time. Okay. So, uh, going on from what you said then, looking at the report there, we're, we're in a healthy position from appeals allowed. And 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 from, um, on those appeals, did we did we get any cost? I didn't see any on there. Did we, did we suffer any cost of being unreasonable? No, we've not had any costs. So they don't deem to be unreasonable. And obviously from the committee's point of view, um, there's nothing much we can learn as a committee that, that, that would, you know, if it was one that one of ours that was overturned effectively. No, the, the, it wasn't a committee appeal decision because it related to a condition, but the committee put the condition on mm. and I think it was well justified, so. But that was, that was dismissed the appeal anyway, yes, so that was they agreed with us. Yes, that's right, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's so none that have gone the other way, as it were. Yeah, good, but generally performance is very high, so that's good. So, and again, thank, uh, pass on our thanks, please, from the committee point of view, for officers, uh, yes, that was excellent work to keep that level down, so we don't, we are, uh, debating and, and, and determining correctly. So, thank you very much. Anybody else got any questions at all on that? No? Okay, then. Thank you. I'll draw the meeting to a close. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for this afternoon. What, there's some excellent debate going on there and some good stuff. Um, to officers, of course, for all their help and those that have gone. If, please pass on my thanks to those. And Democratic Services, obviously, for your support for the meeting. Uh, we do have one in April. Um, whether or not that will have anything on it will, will remain to be seen, won't it? So it may be a no, maybe because Perda drops in, so that you have to be careful what, what comes before us. But we don't want people standing up and shouting about if I'm elected, I won't let this happen, sort of stuff. Not that you would. Anyway, um, so other than that, um, good luck in uh, whatever the future brings for you, and um, we might see you in April. If not, we'll see you in, in the new year and over the chair and over the committee. Thanks very much for your time. Have a good day.